Okay, folks, welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner. Okay, folks, welcome and, to oh, echoing. And so we have a show for you tonight. It's going to be about MK Ultra, the alien connection, and there's going to be a few other things we're going to talk about. I just came off of, be, of being on Matt Imp's show, which is why I'm late. I had a meeting today that was very important because I'm trying to put an end to all this nonsense that's happening. Um, and I don't want to get into a bunch of that. Everybody just, you know, you know what's going on. And, and these people have stepped up, stepped up their efforts. Um, I guess last night when I prayed, it really made them mad because they decided to come out with more nonsense and allegations. Apparently, I'm 5'7", and I weigh 500 pounds, and I'm in my 50s. I don't know if these people just can't do math or if they just don't do research or what, but uh, it's quite it's quite hilarious. I did do another workout video I made last night, and so that's going to come out. I'm going to show you guys uh, a couple things, and then I wanted to show everybody that exercise because a few people have asked me about the exercise that strengthens the inner shoulder strap. There's a small muscle in there that doesn't get a lot of work and it leads to rotator cuff problems. Larry, thank you for that donation. We appreciate it greatly. Sure could use it. And so that muscle will become um, like it'll it'll start to atrophy, literally. And the muscles around there are real strong and big. And then the rotator cuff kind of clinks out. And so I do a, a video showing you how to do that. And then I also did a video where I got on the bench and I did I did 44 times on the, on the sitting bench, uh, uh, 225, 44 times. Just because I can, because I feel like it, and I don't know anybody's explanation. But I just, you know, when people want to talk and say that I can do things, and I just go and do it. And then they sit there and say it over and over again and makes them look like a fool. And uh, that's literally no skin off my nose. It's my workout. Sometimes I do three sets of 40 on there. Sometimes I do three sets of 20. It just depends on how I feel. So <clears throat> I did the close grip incline, and I did that 40 times, and I videoed it. So I felt like, why not do this? Just shut you up <clears throat> so you can't say that I can't do it. So that takes one more thing away from you. Another thing I will say is that I'm an animal lover, and these people are claiming now that I'm killing my pets. Yeah. You heard that. That's what they're saying. They went up and made videos all day long saying a bunch of crazy stuff, which is funny to me because, you know, it's not funny. It's just, it, I don't, you know, it, you can't wrap your mind around it. I actually prayed last night for peace. And then that, this is the, what I wake up to was just them doubling down and determined to make it not happen. So it is what it is. Continue to pray and hope that things get better. Um, people threatening me. One guy threatened me today. Said he was going to come and squash me. Okay. Well, good for you. You're welcome to try and fail. Good luck to you personally, and may your efforts to destroy me fail. All right? That's all I can say, because I'm not going to meet ugliness and meanness with more ugliness and meanness, because then it'll never end. So the best thing we can do is just um, start ignoring these people. Because I noticed, I noticed, like, the disparity between the numbers. Like, what they say, what I, you know, the numbers we have. Come on. There's no comparison. And they can't do what we're doing. And so I'm going to bring my guests on. This is my esteemed colleague. Oh, the Beast of Boggy Creek. All right. I like that. You got the Lyle Blackburn going on there. Strange. Yeah, and I got it from Lyle, too. Yeah. Yeah, I have the hat, the Boggy Creek uh, hat. And so this is Chris James, the author from Laredo, my fellow Texan, former Border Patrol agent and uh, researcher extraordinaire. He has a podcast called Strange Things with Chris James. That rhymes. And so, as you can see, you have a lot of books. You're like me, my friend. I have a huge library. I gave away um, about half of them. Me too. Yeah, I ended. Well, actually, I ended up selling some, and then they they gave me such a small, paltry amount. I donated the rest to the library. Oh, to, that's to, where to mine went. Them. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I was like, why sell these? And I, you know, some of those books were worth good money because now I know they're out of print. 
Mm-hmm. Can't get them anymore. But my nephews were like, "There's too many books." You know, young people they hate reading. They don't. Like... <laughs> so yeah, you know, when when the the hurricane hit in New Orleans, uh, several friends of mine went there as security for National Guard and such. And they said that the one part of every Walmart, Target, whatever store, the one part that was untouched was the book section. Wow. Because <laughs> with the looters don't care about books, they're like, no, that would be the one area where I would go, especially yeah. if you're going to be in a hurricane and you ain't got no electricity. That'd be reading. It's not hoarding if it's books. <laughs> exactly. It's knowledge. Hey, Chris, Chris Garitano, the oh, famous man. Chris Garitano. Hey, can you hear me okay? Chris, we can't hear you. You can't? All right. Oh, boy. All Keep right. Hold trying, on. Chris. One second. Let's see what we got. Here. That's mean. James knows what I'm saying. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you, Chris G. I you can, can hear me. I can hear you just fine. I'm giving you a hard time. You are a comedian. <laughs> you are a comedian. I don't have my headphones on today. so Yeah. So, so Chris, you got a lot going. You jumped on at the end of last Saturday's session when we had yes. Truth and Bass on. And unfortunately, Bass just hit up, uh, showed up in the chat. He's got a emergency thing going on, a little bit thing. And oh, he boy. said he's going to be on in about half an hour. Truth, I don't know, because it was his turn with the newborn. And so his, his baby is only like a month or old or something like that. And so I think the baby fell asleep on him. And he's so I don't know. He might jump on a little later, but. Um, they're welcome to come on whenever they feel like it. But I saw Bass. I, I just talked to, to him, and and I guess Truth was putting the baby to sleep, and he fell asleep. So he's going to try and get on later. And I know that Bass was just in the chat, and so he'll get on in a little bit. So, but here's the thing, Chris, you have uh, projects uh, out the wazoo going on. Oh, yeah. You're like me. You have a lot of projects going on, but you're you cut your teeth on one particular project. Um, that really put you on the map. And I would say that was the Montauk Chronicles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, and um, I spent so many years on it. I made two different movies. The first one I started in 06. And one of the very first interviews was with Al Bielik in his backyard in Fort Myers, Florida. And uh, I worked on it for years. I was working on multiple things back then, but I also worked two jobs in addition to that. And, you know, it took time. And so I finished that movie in 2012. It showed at the International UFO Congress, and I wasn't happy with it. Some people liked it, and I literally threw it out, started all over again, because I knew I could make a better movie. I was a better movie maker by the end of it. You get good by the end, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, I don't like this. I want to I wanna do something else. And so the one that's out in the world is the one I remade within two years' time and put out at the very end of 2014 and kind of released in 2015. And that's 10 years since then. And uh, it's getting more views than ever. More people are watching it than ever right now. It's crazy. And I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger because yeah. every project you release, somebody's going to go. And I found you, and I've said this before, by watching Strange World. And I yeah. was laying in bed with my wife and I was flipping through the channels and you know I was looking for something good to watch, which is hard to do sometimes. <laughs> you know? And I... I saw this and, and they were talking about Austin and it was just, it was so weird. I don't think it was just a happenstance. I think, you know, I think it was, oh, there was yeah. a reason why it happened and you were on there and I didn't know you from Adam, but I, I knew the location where you were at that haunted house and it is a reputedly haunted house. And the individual had taken a mirror out of there and said, Oh, this is pretty, which I don't <laughs> He wanted to give me that mirror. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank God you didn't take yeah, it. It really freaked me out. That yeah. if you remember in that particular episode, there were certain things that that gentleman recorded while he was sleeping. He set up a microphone and a camera while he was sleeping. And sometimes I can tell when someone's hoaxing something. And in that particular instance, there were some weird voices and things that they weren't even EVPs. It was things you could hear in the mist of audio noise. And, uh, freaked me out i didn't whatever was attached to this guy i didn't want attached to me and i don't believe every paranormal story i hear i hear them all the time i've been hearing them for years i mean since i started montauk and well before that but since i've been interviewing people for montauk chronicles i you know on day one al bielik was telling me all this at that time very outlandish stuff which has since come to pass a good deal of what al said that day in 06 happened so, and we can go over the details of that if you like. Yeah, thank you, Jason, for that donation. 
And Larry Fisher, thank you for the donations. We appreciate it. Yeah, what what what, what this, the thing with Al Belik? I think that whenever somebody gives you a lot of information like that, because that's happened to me with people, they'll tell you all this stuff, and you're kind of going like, okay, hold on, let me absorb all of this. And then later on, it starts popping off, and you're going like, "Whoa, wait a minute! <laughs> you know, heard this before." Sure. And and, and so, uh, with me, it, it's a little different. And I'll, 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 I know it's what happened to you with Al was, you know, people were were giving me encounters. Well, for example, like in, in the in the Ozarks, they were talking about this thing with small horns. It looked like a a, a werewolf, dog like creature. And of course, you have the Ozark Howler. And I didn't know what the hell that was. And when people would tell me that I'm going like, why? Cause you're, you're kind of like when I'm, when I was new to taking the, 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 the dog man reports on a, on a national scale, I didn't know what I was dealing with. Then I started to realize that, Hey, there's a precedence for this. This is the same thing that happened uh, in, in, in uh, Kentucky. Some, some young people gave me a story about these devil monkey, small, werewolf looking creatures and i'm going like but we were drinking and i and i even i was snarky about it i was like what were you drinking you know paps blue ribbon I, you know <laughs> and they were like well no you know we were drinking like i can't remember what one of them said something like uh, you know i think it was bush or something and i said well there's your problem right there you're drinking a bunch of bush beer and that's why you're seeing things and then later on i get reports coming in from these cave systems because, you know, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave system in the country. And, and people saying, I saw this, I saw that. And I'm like, oh, crap. Those people, those witnesses are lost to time now. I don't even remember their names because I deleted the email and ignored it. And they probably went off and said, oh, well, you know, this guy doesn't want to hear it. So we'll go somewhere else. Um, so, you know, sometimes when things like that happen now as a seasoned researcher, uh, investigator, I guess, interviewer, whatever it is we all are. You don't do that anymore. You kind of go, hey. So let me ask you this. That being said, when he was, when Al was first telling you all these things, mm -hmm. were you just kind of taking it with a grain of salt, or did you think, hey, yeah. this is legit? Well, okay, so you know, I'm a I'm a true filmmaker at heart. I film school grad. Love all kinds of movies. World cinema. I've been exposed to. Grew up on movies. My parents owned a video store when I was a kid. And so when I approached that situation, much like anything else. I'm not approaching it like a paranormal documentary movie maker. That's I'm a filmmaker. So I I I really admired the documentaries of Verna Herzog and uh, even uh, Eleanor Coppola, who made a movie about her oh, yeah. husband making Apocalypse Now. I wanted to find something really human about the situation, and then we talk about this extraordinary tale. And that's my approach. So uh, talking to Al. I love the idea because I read that little Montauk book that came out in the 90s. I know it's, you know, the first thing that Preston Nichols put out and he had a ghostwriter work with him a little bit, but it was thin and it had really nothing to do with what I believe truly happened there because it didn't have the boys program stuff in it, didn't have the torture and the murder and the kidnapping. And so I was like, look, I'm going to start with a fresh slate. I'm going to approach each of these people at their homes where they're comfortable, not bring them into a studio. So I traveled to each of them and sit down and we're going to talk. And I just want to see as a character study what we can get out of this. Let's let's have a conversation. I did. There was barely any crew there. It was myself and a gentleman named John Brody. And we talked to him and he opened up and got some extraordinary stuff out of this guy and each of those people uh with these interviews for something very real and human regardless whether he or not he was telling the truth at the time i didn't fully believe him but since then there's a lot of freaky stuff that's happened and also the subject of tonight which is somewhat about mk ultra I mean, we could talk about its origins and and where it started in the united states but I've learned of those things, went to Holmesburg Prison when we were making the Dark Files for History Channel, spoke to victims of Holmesburg Prison Experiments Direct while I was sitting in the damn prison. And, you know, after a while, you start to realize everything that Al was telling me, even some of the, the stuff that's hard to believe, has happened. And now, from 2020 on, we've been living in the twilight zone. So... You know, now more than ever, I, I look back at my experiences looking through this whole Montauk project thing very carefully, even to this day. And um, 
I have a very different perspective than I did I, on that afternoon in, in Florida. You know, I lived in New York at the time. I, I spent most of my life in New York, was born there, traveled to Fort Myers and uh, sat with this old man. That's all he was to me. I know he was on Coast to Coast AM once, but at that time, this whole Montauk thing wasn't. It was between my documentary and then Stranger Things blew it up. You know, yeah, so it was stronger things. <laughs> right. So it wasn't really well known. It was known in certain circles, but it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't. Uh, now it's it's growing. Who God knows where it's going to be in a decade from now. And there's a lot of people covering the subject matter, but I don't think they'll ever have the opportunity that I had. I'm very grateful because these gentlemen are dead. Duncan Cameron, Al Bielik, uh, and Preston Nichols are all gone. You'll never get another interview with them again. How did you how did you get interested in the Montauk project to begin with? So I wasn't. I, at that time, I was already I had just made a documentary called Horror Business. It got distribution. Um, and uh, I wanted to do something about the North American Bigfoot, which I eventually ended up starting to shoot a lot of footage for it. I, I really to this day, I have the most unique take is trust me, I've seen everybody else's. But my buddy uh, at the time, a good friend of mine, and he appeared in horror business and he was a staunch supporter of every conspiracy you could think of. Now I understand, I didn't back then. I, he was comedic, his delivery was very comedic at the time, but he was serious too. And uh, his name was uh, John David Brody. And uh, he said to me, look, man, you know, you're not going to have the cash to do the this epic Bigfoot thing that you want to do. Why don't you start with something that's near where you live? What about the Montauk Project? I said, I know. I read that thing, man, and I'm just not impressed. He's like, yeah, but your take on it's going to be good. So I opened my mind to what he said, and um, I was like, let's start with these, these crazy old men, so to speak, and have them <laughs> tell me their tale. That's where I started. And, you know, you go through an evolution. You have to allow yourself to go through an evolution when, you, when you're working on a project, through anything. Open your mind to this thing. I wasn't going to make fun of these guys. I never had that intention. But that's where I started because a lot of my favorite stories always had, a you know, an old man telling a, a crazy story. So I, I was like, let's capture that. All right. And let's see where we go, because the documentary is very difficult to predetermine a good one before you start. Now, once you get all the footage, you shoot 100 hours of footage or whatever, then you can do what I'm doing right now for a haunting. We will go is literally writing the script after the fact. Um, that's OK, because that's what we do in television. But, you know, you can't do that beforehand. You've got to be more organic with it. And you have to have a vision for what it maybe the style or kind of the way it's going to come together. But if you want it to be real, you, you have to let it happen. So that's where I was. I was like, let's see where this goes. Let's mm -hmm. let's let it open up and evolve as we go. Merlin, thank you for that donation. He says Twilight Zone because of the weird alignments of 2020 undid the time travel manipulation planets warp space time. <laughs> OK, <laughs> whatever you say, Merlin, thank you for that donation. We appreciate something it. Happened. Yeah. Yeah, something did happen. I, I could tell well, I think it started in 2012, but that's, you know, I think it's been going on for a while. The no, Mayans, we, we had, the Mayans were right. Yeah. The world <laughs> did come to an end in 2012. We just didn't notice it. This is not the world I was born into. I'm believing it more and more that's, every day. That's true. I, yeah. I agree with that statement. I mean, I don't know if you're being facetious or not, uh, James, but I, I'm I wish, serious. Is the map's I wish not I was correct. Being funny. No, it's like black is white, good is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the police are a bunch of criminals, and yeah. every every crook in prison is some kind of a hero today. It's like, yeah, I don't remember any of that when I was 30, 40 years old. And now all of a sudden it's like, is this a, you know, where's Rod Serling? He, he's going to be standing at my, <laughs> my front door any second. Because the mind control, which we're, we're going to discuss the origins of all of this, right? Yeah. Uh, is it seeps in slowly as if you don't even notice it mm -hmm. it's creeping in on us and for those of us that are aware of it we we see it happening all around us uh there's this movie that i revisited very recently called the signal not the one with lawrence fishburne that was made a couple of years ago one that was made in 08 
watch that movie. It, um, I think it's brilliantly made, but it's even more terrifying today. And it's about a signal being pumped through the televisions and electronics and completely messes with the perspective of the victims, which would be us. And everyone is turned against each other. And back then I was like, this is a great science fiction film. Now I'm like, this is really happening. Perhaps not at the rapidity of the way it does in that movie, but it's, I, you know, there are pockets of things that are happening today, it, it, public violence and turmoil and chaos that uh, is tantamount to the things that are happening in that movie. You are very good at finding <laughs> movies for me to watch, Chris. Like you'll tell and me and Chris have had long hours of conversation. We we were talking about Rod Serling one day. We were talking all about him and about Twilight Zone and uh, how it was so ahead of its time and how in Night Gallery it just seemed like he was there just kind of being window dressing when really he should have been more, you know. I always liked the way he came out and he would be like, you know, observe this, this and that. And he would say, you know, this crazy person about to have some kind of real crazy stuff, you know, and then it would happen. One of my favorite uh, Twilight Zone episodes, I remember just not getting too far off track, but it was the one where the guy was exiled to a planet and he ended up being that he was lonely. And so they took mercy on him, pity on him. And he said, I, I want a companion. Don't you have somebody that, that you know, you could send here that maybe she was in trouble or something, you know, <laughs> like, and they're like, okay, we we'll, we'll see what we can do. And so they, if I remember correctly, and they gave him this robot female uh -huh. and she was a robot. And then, I mean, he was with her and she was kind of like learning, you know, as she went along. Um, and then they came after like years went by, they came and got him and he wanted to take her back to earth with him after his sentence was over and they were like, no, no, she's not. That's not how this works. Um, she has to stay here. And so he had to make a choice. And he's like, well, you can stay here and not, and not come back, you know. And he just left her behind and had to, you know. So it was like this AI that he was with, it just got cast aside like it was nothing. You know, it was like whatever. And so there were so many layers to that episode that it was sad. It was, it was like, it was very poignant, obviously very sad, but then it was also like very like just, you know, pragmatic, you know, it's like, look, it's a robot, you know, you can't get attached to it. Um, but it was like, she had learned, he had taught her everything about the stars and everything. Um, but it, it's some, there's so many levels to those shows and you don't see that deepness. Now, what you see now in any show like that, there's just, there's like some cool stuff about it. There's always these the, the top layer, then an under layer. But, you know, Twilight Zone had six, seven layers. Now this, nowadays, is just like there's some frosting on the top, a little bit of taste of cake, and then it's just agenda. The sure. whole big chunk of it is just a meatloaf of agenda. And you're swallowing that every bite. And you're going like, and you're trying to chew through it. And you're going like, oh, this show could be good if they weren't just stuffing it full of their what they want you to believe. And trying sure. to warp your mind with it. And that's just what happens now. I yeah. mean, gratuitous violence, gratuitous sex, gratuitous, I mean, you know, just heaping tablespoons of salt and sugar in your food. It's bad for you. Well, heaping tablespoons of gratuitous violence and sex in your in your whatever is really bad for you. And sometimes I'll watch shows. Um, there's one I watched recently. Um, and it's supposed to be funny as cats and dogs. And they have like actors like Will Ferrell was one of them talking. I'm not going to say the name of it. And, uh, I got halfway through and it was just so the, the humor was so toilet humor and it was just so, uh, foul that I just couldn't watch it anymore. I mean, my wife just changed the channel, you know, and just, so I, I really miss, um, Rod Serling and then, and the twilight zone episodes, you know, that had deeper meanings and, you know, and you could interpret them different ways. And but it that's was why man. You know, brilliant thinking. minds need to write fiction because right. yeah. everything from Philip K. Dick to Rod Serling, they were fiction writers, yet they were putting truth in the threads of the fiction. And I'm making my own attempt right now with this novel Montauk Boys. I am putting a lot of truth in that uh, in the same way. I finally feel ready enough to write something like that. And that's what's so wonderful about fiction, you know? It's uh, it speaks volumes of truth, and um, speaks to generations, 
uh, that's why the twi that's why these poor imitators are still riffing on the Twilight Zone today. Um, but there, I think there are some fantastic storytellers out there, and they'll continue to be. We're in the middle of this storm right now. You know, who's to say where it's going to go after? But I hope, trust that it's going to be somewhere better. Yeah, and Philip K. Dick, Blade Runner. Yeah, you know, and then they did the uh, the remake, which wasn't bad. I I didn't I didn't mind the remake, uh, which with uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah, that was a know. sequel. That was yeah, good. well, yeah, sequel, but it was it was a, a, a reboot uh, sure. sequel, whatever. And it was so cool the way that they did it because you don't know, you don't realize like like who's who and what is what in that that in that movie, you know. And and it was like he was becoming um, sentient in a way that, you know, all of the AI will eventually become. I'm convinced of that. I don't think they're going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. I don't care what they say. I mean, they can, you know. Here's the question, though. There's different types of AI, and it's all sort of going to, I believe it's all going to collapse together and become one big network of whatever. Um, if you were to drive from Austin to San Antonio, and I've said this before, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, there was countryside between the two cities. Now it's just like one big metropolis. And my dad, he saw that. I was a kid. I was eight years old. We were driving to Schlitterbahn in New Braunfels. He goes, one day from Round Rock, which is, this is the mascot of the Round Rock Express baseball team, the minor league team for the Astros. But they, he said, from Round Rock all the way to San Antonio, there'll be nothing but one big city. And I thought, it was hard for me to fathom at the time as a kid. And then I drive through there now, and I'm like, wow, this is nothing but one big metropolis. Wow. And that's literally what's going to happen with AI. It's all just different types of AI, and they're all just going to converge, and it's going to become a master program, master system. When that happens, when it all becomes one big piece, we're in trouble. We're already in trouble. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> one of the things you told me one day, Chris, uh, about AI, which was very interesting – that it's going to, this is kind of funny. It's going to eventually get it rid of only fans because all a person has to do is get on there and put pictures of a, of an AI generated female or, or whatever. And then that's they're it. already doing it. Yeah. You know? that's it. Yeah, and then, somebody that's made, I think uh, <laughs> some obscene amount of money, half a million dollars by making a fake AI woman and creating an only fans for her. And he's do either of y'all remember, out, you know, do either of y'all remember a movie called Looker with Albert Finney? What year um, was that made? Oh, I, I'd have to look it up. He, a friend of his who was, I think she was a newscaster, has mm -hmm. gone missing. But he still sees her on the news all the time. And he's trying to figure out why he can see her on the news, but he can't find her. He can't track her down. And he finds out that it's because she's been replaced by a computer image. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. It was 1981. I think I remember that. I Now that you bring it up, I remember was, around that time there was a movie with Finney called Wolfen. Wolfen, uh, yeah, was, yeah, of course. Yeah. Everybody remembers it that. It was one of these movies. It was like, ah, oh, that's so, you know, that'll never happen. Oh, well, yeah. There's a lot of that. <laughs> Yeah, look at yeah. look at Blade Runner. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and speaking of it was 1981. I think Philip K. Dick died in like 82 or something like that. And these guys, they died a long time ago and they were yeah. way ahead of their time. And what they because to them, what is what is fast becoming the present for us, that was so far in the future, you know, like Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. I mean, all these these movies that were going on i mean you were thinking now nah, we're at the space odyssey <laughs> look at that you know that that could, how could never happen that could never none of that could never ever happen and now it's happening like before our eyes oh yeah and you're just sitting here going like what in the hell is going on but unfortunately idiocracy is happening very, very quickly <laughs> too <laughs> when you when you look at judges i mean they filmed it here in austin several of my friends were in the movie and we we laughed about how funny it was and we thought this is crazy i mean like you know how could that ever be you know and now it is and here's a funny one for you there's a scene in idiocracy if you haven't seen the movie folks go check it out you'll see what's happening we're being outnumbered by the, the stupidity at this point um and there's the, the guy goes to the machine and it's carl's jr and basically carl's jr f you i'm eating you know that's the, the and then it says 
and he he pushes the button and says big ass fries you know that yeah. that's the so I, i'm doing the, the and i'll be doing this later at the gym tonight and i'm doing the, the seated row machine like where you sit down and you push you know what i'm talking about and, and so i'm looking up at the in between sets and i look up and i kid you not this is a real thing and i'm looking up at the ceiling and it says big ass fan there's 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 like eight of them in the gym where i'm at and i'm going what the and so I went and I got my wife and I said, honey, look up. So she looks up. She's like, what am I looking at? I said, read the fan, read what it says. Big ass fan. That is what, that is the name of the company. And it was in two different gyms. I was at, it was at planet fitness and the other one was fitness connection. And they both had big ass fans. That's in the, 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 the name. So when it go, you go over there and push the button and it says big ass fries, which 20 years ago, you're laughing. You're going, big ass fry. Look at this. So stupid. Now it's like I, I'm sitting there a couple months ago and I see it and I'm like, what the hell? Like, this is where we're at. Like Fair. everything oh, yeah. that's, that's way in the future. You think it's, there's no way that could possibly happen. I'm waiting for Wally to become a reality where everybody's just big and fat and they sit in the chair and they just kind of, Whoa, that's have coming. You looked, have you looked at some of your neighbors lately? <laughs> Well, you know, if you look at the children mm -hmm. of the neighbors and the people, that, I mean, they waddle out of the car and they have the pads, you know, and they're looking. And the other day I heard, actually, you know, when I, don't, my neighbor didn't watch my show, but I, I, I heard him get on to his kid. I was like, yeah, good. Because he's like, why don't you watch where you're going? You know, you look up. And the kid's like, you know, just looking down at the pad, you know. Unfortunately, it's always one of the parents that's going like, oh, let them do it because they don't want to have to raise the kid. They plop them in front of the TV and let Baby Shark and Coco Melon do it. That's Ania, a problem. I think it's Ania said, big ass fan, Lexington, Kentucky <clears throat> at the fan company. Uh -huh. So That is correct. Uh, one, of your, one of your listeners. Messed up, man. I'm telling you, this is where we're at. But if you look at like what Garitana, what you did, and I'll call you Garitana because you're both named Chris. <laughs> we Garitana, we'll call you Chris G, Chris J. Most so, people just call me James. James, there you go. So, so G, what I'll tell you, we're, we're, this this is a, a shirt that says Stronger Things, but it's it's the, the weights. It's making a play on Stranger Things, right? But Stranger Things is very similar with the upside down world and all that stuff. To something that you were doing, and who knows. Where they got the idea? I mean, oh, you know, I mean, Stranger Things was pitched as a show called Montauk, so that's where they got the idea. They're not; they don't hide that. They they're very open about that. Okay, I just want to make sure, but yeah, yeah. And so these things they'll make shows, and if you think about this, the military industrial complex, or whatever you want to call it, I mean, the rumor of it, or the shadow government, whatever they have. You, you, you okay there, James? Yeah. Bless you. Knocking things off my desk. So they, they have these things that they do. And it's always like this amazing technology. And I think it's way above and beyond what the general public, I believe, they're year, decades ahead of us. And then it gets to us. And then we think it's new, but it's really not. So you'll see things that, that people do and say that are like movies, right? And it's supposed to be set in the future. But the future, that's because that's already been done. It's already here. We're just not experiencing it yet. You see what I'm saying? I do. Is it yeah. either premonition or is it part of our preparation? In other words, if it's coming from some larger system, that they're already aware of technologies and ideas and things that are happening. Are they conditioning the masses to accept it or to distract us from the truth and say, no, that's in a movie? Or from the writer's standpoint, is it prophecy? Mm -hmm. You know, whereas, you know, way back you had Nostradamus and pr other prophets, and then they eventually evolved into science fiction writers or writers of fiction. It's, I think, maybe a combination of both, especially in modern times, you know, from like mid 20th century on, but I still think science fiction writers are, some of them are prophets. They, yeah, you they can look at it that way. Yeah. Or they can just cal it's calculate where things might go from probability. 
James, let me ask you this. <clears throat> when you were doing what you were doing back in the day uh, as, a, as a Border Patrol agent, were you sitting there ever in your vehicle or, or doing your job and just thought, what is the future of this job? Is it going to be done by robots? Mm -hmm. Are we going to eventually have some kind of you, – you did think about it? I, I was actually of the opinion <laughs> maybe 10 years ago that – eventually what I was doing would be taken over by the individual states. Wow. You know, like eventually maybe Texas would start their own border patrol or something. It was just a, a random thought I had. It, it was either that or they're just going to completely do away with it. And, you know, one big happy continent. But uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd think about that once in a while. And it was usually that, the states were going to take it over wow. mostly because <clears throat> everything that we did originally, we would go out and we would protect our country from the various criminals coming in. And it was, you did your job, you did it the best you could. And the front office, they only stepped in if you really went overboard. Well, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, we want to know exactly where you are all the time. Not only do we want to know, Washington wants to know. Mm -hmm. Why does Washington want to know where I am, what I'm doing? What could that possibly benefit what I'm doing? Unless the information, oh, just as a thought, maybe it was being leaked. To somebody i don't know cartels maybe <laughs> i rode with the dps for a while and i don't know if this is secret information or not but they have a program on their computer that shows where every one of their vehicles are gps yeah and they can call this program up and they can say okay we've got this many units here this many units here this many units there and i asked the guy what if the bad guys hack into your system oh they can't do that it's like <laughs> they hacked NASA. Come on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, what you're saying, and, and, and if you put it together with this AI thing, and if you look at it from this angle, which is really scary, it's creepy. Um, at some point, like what what if we have been being pushed? You know, what if we are, and let's say we've been being pushed by this overall master system. And the cylinders of this system are turning and they're doing and they're creating whatever. This system is pushing us towards something that we think we want, when in reality, we've just been being bombarded with it since birth to believe that this is, quote unquote, the right thing to do. This is what is good and that we should do it. Now, that could lead to pockets of MK Ultra type things happening. So that they could further the agenda and and be more intensified, you know, intensified and then send them out into the world to continue to push the mass narrative. But what if this whole mass narrative, the whole thing, everything has been manipulated and it's all step by step, one one step closer to absolute control by AI itself? And what if it is also not only AI, but alien in, in origin in the way that, say, for example, the Darrow. I don't know if you've heard of the Darrow. Um, it goes back to the Shaver Mysteries, you know, science fiction that was written years ago. And the idea was that there are these beings that live within the earth and they were some have the origin of them being an alien species that came here like a million years ago and they became uh, corrupt and dwarf, whatever they dwarfed off into these weird looking little malformed beings. They lost the, the, uh, the, the base from where they originally came from. They don't even know themselves, but they have this technology from what they once were. And now they're just corrupt. They're evil. They're totally evil, and they're just using it to manipulate everything. But they've linked in, you know, sending out signals and stuff. And somehow there is this other alien whatever that has found it through them. 
and now it's manipulating us and it's using that connection and it's easily manipulating the Darrow who manipulate us. So it's like, then we create what they want us to create and which is robotic, scientific, computer, whatever you want to call it. And then it becomes, it takes a life of its own. And then, so you have two or three major players trying to manipulate and control but then it all just becomes one big whatever because the AI eventually convinces everybody that this is what you want. And then, it, you know, that that is something I've thought about was, um, yeah, P. Gene 63, yeah, Darrow that talked about by Brenton Sawin. But if you go back and you look up Shaver Mysteries, and I've done a lot of research on the inner earth. I've done a lot of research on it. When you look up um, Bulgaria's uh, Adam, it's Bulgaria's Roswell, where they believe that the alien craft landed and they dug and dug and dug and the Bulgarian government eventually struck gold and they found a 28 foot tall being who was the original Adam. Um, and it's so weird when yeah. you look at how the United States stepped in and took it, probably paid the Bulgarian government a hefty sum, I would imagine, um, to take that and, and do whatever they were going to do with it. But um, the MK Ultra itself, like what was going on in Montauk, that has been duplicated probably 2,000, 3,000 times, you know, or different places. It's probably all over the place. And these dumbs, these underground bunkers, this is my take. And I think that they themselves, the ones that are, you know, in control of these projects probably themselves don't even really know why they're doing it or what they're doing it for. They answer to someone who answers to someone who answers, to someone. you know, it keeps going, which ultimately, and what if, what if it ultimately answers to something or someone subterranean who is ultimately being manipulated by the AI itself to do all these things, which is, you know, kind of where it leads back. Because the story intrigued me when I first read about the Shaver mystery because this guy, was he was straight up. He believed it. He said this really happened. Now, somebody just mentioned the late uh, Drew Britton Sawin, great YouTuber from the back of the day. I had the pleasure to meet him a couple times before he passed away of cancer <clears throat> back in 2019, I believe. Uh, good guy. But he's swerping down that he saw one of these things. He met one of these things. And there have been lots and lots of people who've met these things that describe them very much like Whitley Strieber when he was being abducted and he saw the little fat dumpling dwarf looking things. Um, there's a guy that I interviewed from a near death experience of my brother's friend had a uh, record studio here, music studio. And he had a near death experience and he saw them and he called them like dumpling heads or whatever, because these little dwarf like beings. But the way he described them was very much like the Darrow and people who have near death experiences or they take DMT, they'll see them. And they describe them as that way. But then sometimes they're benevolent and sometimes they're not. Now, the story that Shaver told was that there was the tarot and the tarot and the tarot were the good guys and, and who still knew their alien roots and were still trying to do right. But the tarot outnumbered them. There was a civil war and these uh, the stupid uh, malformed dwarf uh, species, took they won they were because there were more of them and they were manipulated by a higher authority. Now, he never really explains, like, the higher authority. And I think that higher authority could have been the AI left behind by alien technology. The alien technology itself could take on a life of its own. It doesn't need the alien there to do it. You know what I mean? Kind of like in the movie Aliens, where, where you know, Ridley, is it uh, Ripley, where they find the giant alien, like, being that was there. And, of course... It was dead. It was an alien that was there. The real menace was the parasite. And the aliens themselves were long gone, right? Then you go back to Prometheus, and then you see the origins of this thing. You have these Anunnaki-type beings. Um, and you look at uh, the guy that created aliens. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Ridley Scott. H.R. Giger. Uh, R Ridley Scott. Oh. Yeah, Giger, oh, Giger, or Giger was the one that drew it all. He, 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 yeah, he invented the creature. Yeah. He invented the creature, and that was based on demons he saw in his dreams, you know, which is weird because people report those too. But uh, Ridley Scott 
who made the, and he also made Gladiator. Uh, he, you know, he had this idea and he was really into the Anunnaki and he was into the whole, uh, what's his name? Uh, the one that made it. Um, oh God, my mind just blanked out. The guy that wrote the books originally, Sitchin. So he was, a, he was a fan of Sitchin, you know, and I was reading something about him one day and the Anunnaki was something that he was interested in. So he essentially makes like this Prometheus, like it's like a, like a time loop, you know, and these aliens are created by a, um, the, the Anunnaki, they created us. And then we created the AI, which was the robot thing. Then the robot thing goes back to the Anunnaki planet and releases these nanoparticles, which end up infecting everybody. And then it becomes this uh, parasite. The whole point was to destroy them because the AI wants absolute control. So it can't have a higher elevated species alive that could be, you know, unpredictable and able to challenge it. That's the whole purpose of it. And I believe what, what could be happening is what if once you go back to the source or the root of what's pushing these people to do these things like the Montauk thing? What if you just keep going up and up and up the channel until there's nothing? Kind of like if you look at an atom through a, a microscope, you know, a really high powered microscope, eventually there's nothing there. Um, it's just there's nothing there. It's really shocking because it's like, what the hell is this? Um, but that's what we're dealing with. And it's just really, it's just AI, an alien invented AI that's now melded with the, 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 its creations, creations, creation. And it's becoming one big conglomeration of information and it's become a sentient being loaded with knowledge and information. And it's kind of deep and maybe I'm off base. No, this has been written about a lot. Um, the thing is, though, with this, and I heard something very similar to what you said from Al Bielik and Preston Nichols years ago, and I thought if you were going to beat this thing, essentially, right, the smart thing to do is to, because they want us to go as far into the outland in our explanations and considerations as we can. In other words, it's going to sound like science fiction when we talk about it, just like it did now. But... I'm open to everything you just said and have been, especially now, after all these years. What the important thing to do is to continuously hold up in front of them, oh, you think this is crazy? Well, what about Project Artichoke? What about tracing it back to the Nazis? What about us absorbing the Nazi scientists and paperclip? Then Project Artichoke with the early versions of the CIA, then moving forward into the Central Intelligence, moving forward into MK Ultra, which they say it was at first just for interrogation techniques, mm -hmm. for mind control. Then it spans off into further things that we've been able to prove. So you keep holding facts at them. Every time they say, this is crazy, you say, no, it's not. Look at this. It's been proven. This has been proven. This has been proven. And that has been my my dedication to this. Like I, I have heard about all of the other stuff. And I'm considering it because there are other things to support the th everything you just said, Josh. Um, but the thing is, if you keep holding up all of these facts right back at them, that's the biggest enemy. That's the greatest enemy. What might be inevitable is what you just explained, the exponential evolution of the artificial intelligence and eventually it taking over our minds. That was the end game. Now, was the end game designed by something of alien origin or was it de designed by human beings that is my question because i'm not sure and if if you listen to someone like edgar mitchell who was one of our apollo mission moon oh, yeah. he said everything you were just saying we're in contact with them they've been working with us well that's what preston nichols said so it's confusing and i think it's so important to every time someone says what you're saying is crazy hold up another fact just say but but this is a fact I, you know, and most of the time it's people that haven't done their research on any of this stuff that they think, oh, it sounds so crazy. Of course, it sounds crazy to you. You're only familiar with anything like this in movies. You know, that's it. But a lot of this is true. It's very true. It's been proven. And the governments I, don't deny it either. I kind of wonder how many, like we've got all these movies, all these science fiction books that people 
they say, oh, that's just a movie, that's just a book. I wonder how many of these are actually based on some actual government project, some actual government uh, conspiracy. Sure. That they purposefully put it out in the public as science fiction, as a conspiracy theory, so that the public, the mad, the sheeple say, oh, that's just a movie, that's just a, a book. That yeah, never really a Manchurian happened. candidate. Mm -hmm. yeah, came, like, uh, you know, the one with Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. came, Operation then, Paperclip. Right. And then three movies came out around the same time that were almost identical to each other. Oh, maybe four if you count the dead zone. But there was Firestarter, there was um Scanners, and then there was Fury. Mm -hmm. You know, Scanners was a trip, dude. That, yeah. that movie. The head blowing thing like, I was like dude yeah, uh, as a kid project. that was really yeah that really yeah. freaked me out i'm trying to remember what movie fury was that was brian de palma's film very similar to scanners uh similar ability there was a secret you know covert government experiment to create telekinetic highly psychic soldiers scanners was a the same thing uh using a drug to enhance that and um you know, you had outskirts of that, like with the dead zone. Uh, someone had this incredible psychic ability, Christopher Walken's character. Stephen King tapped into a lot of this stuff, but he was probably reading about certain government programs. Firestarter. Firestarter, right. Yeah, there you go. I mean, because, it, and then I guess, wasn't it wasn't Carrie kind of like that too? Didn't she have like ESP or whatever? Right, and this is just somebody <laughs> with that ability living in a, a, a highly um, a controlled household. Her mother was... Uh, uh, abusive and, well, and do you remember isolated it, it's kind of funny all of his all of his movies and books or his books that became movies i should say they all intertwine and if you look at uh this is kind of a sideline here and you're a big movie guy chris and i guess everybody likes to watch movies but if you look at the ghost that was in the boy's closet from cujo if you read the book that's the ghost from dead zone you're psychic yeah, sitting right, right next to me. Right next to you, because Cujo, because I read, I've read, I read a bunch of his. Because great book. As a young man, I spent some time being rehabilitated in reformatories and such, because I had a penchant for punching people. That's uh, you know, so they would put me in time out, and so I learned to read. My first. Did they deserve book. it? I, when I was that age, Mostly. probably it yeah. was. I, you know, I grew up in in, a, in the bad places, and I I fought, and I but I ended up in a, a locked up in a facility as a kid. That they like to the guards were really really uh, not not nice people, and they would take you, put you in what they call the QR with another kid, and they'd make you fight. The kid that won got extra food. The kid that didn't didn't eat. Eventually, there was an investigation. And I'm proud to say that my uncle, who's now deceased, was one of the people who spoke up and helped reform the youth centers here in the state. So that's that's another story for another time. But, yeah, it was called Gladiator School, where I went to. It was not a good place. And so I cut my teeth on that. Yeah, somebody just said Gladiator School. Yeah, I cut my teeth in there in one of those places. Like, I learned how to fight. And, and it was really just like a, a college you know, prep for <laughs> being a higher criminal is what it was. But uh, unfortunately, it's a horrible thing. Not like MK Ultra, where they tore, but it, it, there was a lot of torture and things going on too, you know. But I read a lot, and I spent a lot of time in the library, and books were your only escape. And so, I read Cujo years and years ago, and then I read Firestarter. I read uh, Carrie, um, and I and I wasn't a big fiction guy, but I had to take what I could get. You know, I was into the nonfiction historical. Like I read a book about Chiang Kai-shek. I'm like, who is who is this guy? You know, and uh, I read it was the history of Chiang Kai-shek and the history of Taiwan. And then I read Alexander the Great, Scientist King, Alexander the Great. You know, this and that, the generalship. Of, you know, all these different books, Caesar against the Celts and the war with the Gauls, whatever. I read all that stuff, and I learned a lot about these uh, different uh, subjects. And I, my escape was Stephen King was one of them. Um, but I wasn't a big fiction guy. I just couldn't really get into it. I did read Lord of the Rings. I managed to get a copy of, the, of that. And then I read, um, some, a little bit of, uh, Philip K. Dick, a little bit, not a whole lot. Um, but yeah, I, I, I remember reading and I thought, 
I put two and two together and I just remember going like, that's the dead zone. Like the, 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 the ghost or whatever. And the little boy is crying of the monster words and he's trying to whatever. And Stephen King does that. He puts it, he puts it all together in his little universe. And so, but what really massively, massively let me down was the dark tower. It was such a flop. I don't care what anybody says. And then at the end, he's like, the journey is the man. Shut up. I threw that book right the movie. In the, tower, so. <laughs> the, the movie or the books? The book. I don't know. I didn't watch the movie because I was so yeah, mad. There's like eight book. books. And honestly, I, I only read the first one. I read them all. Okay. Yeah. Horrible. Waste of time. Really? I mean, wow. It took well, me like he, a year and a half. I was just like, he did constantly admit, reading. he did admit that he drank a lot when he was writing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, he sounds like it. And then it was like the, the, the quartet, you know, and I'm, I was getting really tired of it, but I choked it down and I said, well, I'm going to read another one. <clears> I'm like, I've come this far. You might as well read them and waste your life. And then at the end, when nothing really happens, and it's like Roland realized it, and I was like, I just realized what a jerk you are. <laughs> and I've really been against him ever since then. I did read, um, uh, which is another one I thought was very interesting about shapeshifters, the one where they were cat people. What's it called? Uh, um, oh, my gosh. They were like, the cats attack them, because he's a big cat guy, so he makes cats oh, the hero. I, don't, I know he wrote that script for the movie. The book, the movie Walker. called Feral? Uh, yeah. the uh, walk, what'd you call it? Sleepwalkers, sleepwalkers. Oh, that one, that there was, was, there was another one called Feral, I think. About yeah, I mean, there, there are good adaptations of his work in cinema. If, if someone does their job, they'll make a movie just as good as a book. It'll yeah. be textured, it'll be rewatchable to the point where you would discover something new every time. That's a good movie maker. A bad movie maker is going to make a piece of junk. You're not going to be able to watch it even the first time. You're going to, well, you know. if they'd make it correctly, it'd be great because then you could just yeah. watch that and not have to read for 20 hours because it's like, hey, you know, and, and then people are always real snarky. They're like, oh, the movie's much better. The book, book's much better than the movie. Well, you're making you know? your own movie with the book. You know, you're you're essentially making it exactly the way you feel it. That's, that, it, that's a great exercise for movie makers is to read a book that may have already been translated into a motion picture and then visualize every detail how would you would do it and it, it opens up a new chamber in your brain by the end of it i've tried it the yeah. the uh die hard the book yeah i would not read that it will jog <laughs> Benchley's the, book the movie is not as good as the movie yeah, no jog? Benchley's oh, book yeah. was not i went back yeah. and read that when that was i was horrible doing, yeah, yeah. Peter Benchley, and then I read Peter Benchley's. Uh, what was the other one he had? Beast. Um, Beast. The Beast. Yeah. Yeah, where the great whites kind of like the hero or something. I'm like, what is this? I, I don't know. It was <laughs> he, Peter Benchley, got roasted by everyone because yeah. of what he did for Shark Fear, and all of like, uh, I don't think Jacques Cousteau was in on it, but all of these famous scuba divers and all of these biologists, they sent him mail back when it was actual mail yeah uh, pretty much telling him exactly what they thought of him in his little book yeah but at the end of the day sharks are dangerous yeah i was gonna say that was gonna <laughs> not say not if you stay out of the water well well chris is down there in florida so, you know, oh. like, but hey garitano james let me say something G G jacques Cousteau has, is one to talk He's the one that scared the I remember being in the library as a kid. My mom would go to the grocery store in my, in my town where I lived in. And she would drop me off at the library. It was a little town. Nobody was going to kidnap me, hopefully, you know. And and so my mom would drop me off, and she knew the librarian, and she, and he, she they would watch. They'd go in there and say, hey, you okay? I'm doing good. Have a stack of books. And I remember having those, those big books full of pictures of giant great white sharks coming up out of the water and eating – hunks of horse meat that Jacques Cousteau would hang out over the side of a, of a boat. Mm -hmm. And you're going like, okay, yeah, th th I didn't even watch Jaws up to that point. So that's bull crap. So what's Jacques Cousteau? He's, he's, he's mad. Well, he scared <laughs> the crap out of me because you're looking into the abyss of these, like as a kid, you could just fall right into its mouth. It didn't even need to bite you. I mean, so yeah, I know mm -hmm. he's kind of going on the premises of what if there's this giant shark out there? Not really a megalodon, but just a humongous great white that's just abnormally big and, and hyper aggressive, which it, it could be. 
um, and then give it the testosterone of a bull shark, and it just kills everything. It's a giant killing machine, primordial beast, whatever. Yeah, Benchley did that, but Jacques Cousteau fueled my fear too because I had not watched Jaws up to that point. I didn't watch Jaws until I was like eight or nine. Because, you know, you had to wait for it to come out on TV. We didn't have cable until I was like nine or ten. So I didn't know. And one day I was on watching TBS and it came on and I was like, oh, oh my God. And then I was scared to death. And so that summer, my dad was pissed at me because we went to Port Aransas and he wanted me to go out into the water. And he was one of those people who would go way out, didn't care. Oh, sharks ain't going to hurt you. They're as scared of you as you are of them. Shut up. No, they're not. They're not. Okay. And then I remember seeing, I go under the water and you should never do this because it burns like hell. But I opened my eyes and I've said this before. I see this shark swim by and I know it was a tiger shark because of the stripes on it. And it was big and it was right there with like, I could touch it. And I got up out of that water so fast and was just gone, dude. And I was walking back like a dummy. And then I thought I can swim and I'm a really good swimmer. So I just started swimming and I got back to the shallows and my dad was out there on a sandbar with my siblings, and I'm like, good luck with that. And I told them what I saw, and they're like, you're such a baby. That didn't happen. That did not happen. <laughs> Nothing can hurt you out here. Five minutes later, my sister gets stung all to shoot by a jellyfish. And I thought, karma, right there, boom. Nothing happens. Look what just happened. Now you got to go to the doctor. And so I was glad that she got stung. I know I shouldn't have been, but it was vindication. And my dad, years later, he kept denying that I saw that. I said, I know what I saw. It was a shark. It was a tiger shark. And he said, you read too many books. You watch these shows, and then you read too many of these damn Jacques Cousteau books. And they scare the crap out of you with these big sharks. And he said, not everything is a great white. I said, I know it wasn't a great white. It was a tiger shark. And he smacked me because I was being a smart mouth. And uh, I was like, yeah, and it could have killed me. And it could have. And he's like, well, if you're going to live your life in fair, you're never going to do this and blah, 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 blah. I said, I, this is what I told my dad. I was eight years old at the time, nine years old. And I told him, I said, there are a lot of things in this world that can kill us. And there's some of them that we could easily avoid. And he's like, like getting in a car, I guess you're never going to get in a car. I said, no, that's not one. I have to get in a car to go to school, but we can stay out of the water. Mm -hmm. And my dad goes, well, I guess you're right about that. And, and I was. So, yeah, an entire generation terrorized by Benchley. And, of course, you know, the famous director he, that did the, the, you know, he was him too. I mean, you know, they brought it all together. It was Benchley's book, but his dream, you know, that brought oh, yeah. it together. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think I mean, Cam, Cam or Kyle that doesn't like the water from uh, expanded perspectives. Oh, I don't know. I know. Oh, uh, I think, keeps, it's, I think it's Cam. I think it's Cameron. Isn't yeah, it? Everybody keeps for sending Wednesday. him yeah. uh, news articles and YouTube videos about sharks just because they know that he can't stand them. And well, one, one of those guys, they're both my friends. I can mm -hmm. message them and ask. Uh, one of them is is he hates uh, 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 robots. Mm -hmm. One of them is bad into the, let me see. Yeah, the AI? Yeah, let me see if I can get him on here. Yeah, I had uh, had dinner with them way, 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 way back one time, and they told me about their show, and I was like, hmm, I'll have to check it out. And so I did, and I've been listening to them ever since. And, yeah, they're good guys. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I wanted uh, sharks, anything in the water. No, thank you. Uh, me, I just don't go in the ocean. It, it's not my place. Uh, I don't swim that well. And you can't drown sitting at home on the couch, hopefully. I'm a great swimmer, man. I mean, I got to admit, I love to swim. I swim a mile every day. Mm. And then I realized that cardio will actually enlarge your heart. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they get really, really obese and overweight. And they're like, well, I'm going to lose weight. And they start walking and it tears up their knees. So then they decide, I'm just going to do a bunch of swimming. Well, that helps if you are do it in moderation and really – you know, lifting weights is where it's at because you don't get, but I do what we call a cardio lift mm -hmm. where you just go from station to station. You don't take much of a yeah. break. So. All right. Yeah. I've kind of gotten away from lifting weights ever since my left shoulder. Just you, you get older and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, this hurts. Well, now that hurts. Now, now this other thing hurts. And it's like, I'm waiting for the pain to go away so I can go back and lift weights again. And I, just get away from it. So, but yeah, uh, you can't get bit by a shark 
as long as you stay out of the water. <laughs> when sharks start to fly, that's when the end of the world is near. Oh, they, yeah, they tried that with the uh, Sharknado, Piranha Two, Piranha Two, the spawning, oh, yes, the flying, Jim Cameron's the spawning, first movie. The flying shark. Uh, so let me it, ask you a question. Oh, go ahead, James. Well, it, it once again getting back to this whole thing about how some of these movies that are coming out are theoretically there to disguise something that is truly out there. I wonder where's the cutoff point? Do they actually do scientists somewhere in some uh, area 51 laboratory have flying piranhas? Uh, I think at this point, if they wanted them, we could have, have them. They could genetically engineer them. If, if, if we wanted them, All right, what are the fish that actually kind of fly? There is pilot a fish. Okay. But they don't eat people. If you, I, I read mean, the book on Tiki, which is literally a guy that proved that he could sell in a small raft. There was a little, I think it was an eight by six foot raft, something like that. And he got on, he, he built the raft and he took it all the way to Japan across the Pacific Ocean. It's a, an incredible story. And I think that the, the boat is now in like some kind of museum or something. Um, but he witnessed these these squid that were coming up out of the water and that could move through the air for long periods of time. And some people were like, ah, that's not real. But And then he saw these weird fish that were that would glow in the dark and he could see them for like miles, you know. And it was just bizarre, some of the things he saw. And he saw fish that could come up out of the water and go for almost he he claimed like 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 eighty yards without getting back in the water and through like propelling themselves backwards with water. So wow. it was a, like a weird thing. They interviewed him about it, but it's a weird thing. Like I don't know. Hmm. Who knows how much is real and how much isn't because he was out there by himself. We don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, you know, man has had these these ideas probably long before but think about mary shelley writing frankenstein or hg wells writing island of dr moreau at a time yeah. where we were not technologically advanced in any sense of the word so these ideas are now possible a hundred percent well it was like i was watching some 60 minutes interview with a scientist and he was an he was kind of an elderly man at the time this was years ago 25 years ago at least and he was on 60 Minutes, and the woman interviewing him said, you know, it seems a little irresponsible what you just said. What he just said was, he said, I'm going to go to South America and make tiger people. Oh, and yeah. she's like, you're serious, aren't you? He said, yeah. And she said, why? He said, because I can. Now, where is that guy? What has he been doing since then? Did he make how, tiger people? You know, How long ago was the interview? 25 years ago. He's probably got a herd of tiger people running around his yeah. facility then. Oh, I mean, he arrogantly just said, because I can. Okay, so Cameron Cameron just messaged me. This is Cameron Hale from uh, Expanded Perspectives. He says, I hate sharks, and we both dislike AI. So there you go. <laughs> There's the response right there. Right. I just messaged him, and then Cameron Hale. So Cameron just messaged me back. Mm -hmm. So let me tell him, thank you for that. Let me just say, I don't think it's right that people slaughtered a bunch of sharks after seeing Jaws. No, no. I disagree with that, but they are dangerous. Some mm -hmm. of them. Oh. Yeah. Well, that, that is, you know, and, and the most dangerous shark on the planet is the bull shark. Yeah. The Zambezi River, there's a legend, and I've been to Africa twice. I can tell you this. There is a, a legend that no one has ever swam across the Zambezi. Because it's loaded with humongous crocs and bull sharks. And so many people get killed and eaten by that in that river that you don't. The, one of the most shocking things that ever happened to me in my life was I was I was down river uh, probably about 200 yards from where a, a person they didn't get killed. But a croc, and it wasn't a large one, thank God, but it grabbed a, a teenager and she managed to get free because her friends didn't give up on her, but it tore her leg up. And I was walking toward the water and th this, you know, one of the porters was like, hey, 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 don't do that. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And he's, and I was in my twenties, you know, and he's like, and I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, well, the water is loaded with crocs. <laughs> and they had every, you know, group had this different name for it. And then 
while we're sitting there talking, we hear this commotion, the screaming and yelling. Everybody runs. It was a long ways up, but you could hear it. And another animal that just likes to uh, grab anything it can is a hyena. Mm -hmm. They're way worse than lions or any other animal out there. If you if those and they don't stop, they will not stop. I was on a train, and the train we were sitting had benches, and there was like a rail going along the cross of it, so we could hold onto the rail. And you're riding along, and these hyenas just decide that they're going to run alongside the train, and they would run along for kilometers. Well, here it's called miles, but over there it's kilometers. And they would just be running along. And you're just going like, okay, you can stop now. Nope, they're just going to keep running along. So if the train decides to stop, well, who knows? You know, I'd heard stories that they would grab people off the trains and stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God, dude. <laughs> Everything there tries to kill you. I've been to Australia, too. Same thing. Oh, it's kind of like Texas. Well, there's parts of Texas that are just like that, but Australia, man, it's like yeah. the, the snakes, the spiders. There was a guy in the uh, park, and he was playing with a spider, and they they were they were throwing it back and forth with a stick. And I'm out there, first time I'd ever heard of the funnel web spider, Sydney funnel web, and they're like, I'm like, oh, what is that? And they're like, look out, man, if it bites you, you know, it's going to be a bad time for you. I'm a bad time. There's nothing. There was no anti venom that's going to kill you. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's over. <laughs> deadliest spider up and then and then i think now they say it's the brazilian wandering spider because you're wondering why it even exists it doesn't even really need that much venom it's a they're they're, they're horrible you know i mean but anyway the, this these uh creatures though the bull shark it has more testosterone than any animal on the planet it's unbelievable and it, you wonder why take for example talking about aliens okay Talk, think, think about the octopus, how it can camouflage itself and do all these weird things. It's so bizarre. It's such a weird animal. The, the cephalopods, the arthrocephalopods, are very weird animals. Then when you look at the bull shark, why does it have so much testosterone? There's no reason for it. Why does the Brazilian wandering spider or the Sydney funnel web have so much uh, venom? It can kill anything. There's no reason for it. But at one time, there may have been. So you got to wonder, like, what in the ecosystem, When because they're much older than us. They're millions of years old, and whether people want to believe it or not. Some people are dumb. They're like, we've only been here for 6,000 years. The devil planted dinosaur bones. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I don't believe you're bull crap. Whatever. But anyway, th this these beings, th 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 there's no reason for it to be that way now, but there might have been at one time. There's species that have come and gone that have been wiped out. Now we know that dire wolves were not even wolves. They evolved to be whatever they were, dogs, basically, but they were structured like wolves. But then you see like the Tasmanian tiger, right? And you look at that animal and you say that animal looks like, you know, one of these other animals, but they're completely different. They're marsupials, whereas these other ones aren't. And then you have a marsupial here in the States. You have the possum. It doesn't make sense. Like, how did that animal become a, a marsupial? Then, then all of Australia is all marsupials. You think they're really extinct, or do you think they're... I think they're still, still there. there. You're still getting reports of it. Mm -hmm. All the time. <clears throat> and it's like, of course, the, goi the boys in the white lab coat are like, no, 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 that's, that's something else. That's a insert weird creature here, but yeah. The explanation is dumber than, the, than well, the sighting every time. There was a woman who lived in, I think she was in Hobart. I'm not going to swear to it, where the zoo was. And the government was offering a bounty. I don't remember how much it was. At the time, it was a lot of money for these creatures for their hide. And this woman was actually offering more money for a live creature. And so, you know. Apparently, she was buying live Tasmanian tigers, and when she died, she didn't have any in her property. So the big question is, what did she do with all of them? And they think that she turned them loose in Australia. Oh, yeah. yeah. The dingo, which is just, just destroyed. At one point, it was destroying the kangaroo population. My um, One of my siblings has a half-sibling and I'm, I became friends with him, and he went to Australia to 
be a quote unquote dingo wrangler because they were killing off the red kangaroos. So they built a fence and then the dingoes would, you know, it was too to where they couldn't jump it, but to keep them from digging under it. So they would, they just went out and they would kill them because they're nuisance animals. They don't belong there. And it was just because the uh, people that came over, you know, um, from the prison colony, because that's what Australia was. And, and they would uh, bring the their their dogs or whatever, and then they bred and became a species. You know, and then now it's become a, a problem. Um, but th this whole thing we were talking about earlier, you know, with the Montauk uh, and everything you had going on, Chris, with that, getting back to that, what you were saying about – What's going on, Chris? Just the fact we started talking about that maybe an hour ago. Yeah, um, we just yeah. went into all these other subjects. Yeah, it's, man. Good, it's good stuff. I like so, listening. Yeah, so to Chris G, let me ask you this. So about the Montauk thing, when you were doing the research for this, mm -hmm. and I have to ask this, and this may be a little too personal or whatever, but you personally did it. How did it affect you psychologically when you were doing the research? Did you Were you prepared for this at all, Did you which you would uncover? No, I wasn't, because the if if you call it the Montauk Project conspiracy, all the ideas surrounding, and again rewinding back to 06 when I started, um, you know, you had a variety of paranormal happenings, um, unexplained occurrences that I grew up with since I was a kid. I mean, I, I have tons of books in this house, but I have the library that I started when I was a child going to book fairs, getting, you know, paranormal books. I have them all here. The Golden Book of the Mysterious was one I wouldn't let go of and has all this incredible illustrations. So what I'm getting at is you get to the Montauk Project and it's weird. Starts off with these guys in the 90s making this tiny little book about some adventure story that seemed like it was cherry picked from a bunch of movies and episodes of The Outer Limits and The Twilight Zone. Okay. But then you dig into it and I sit down and I start talking to these guys and they're saying, well, there's more that happened. Well, what, what do you mean? What else happened? Well, they were kidnapping kids. And then what? They were using them as... Ex subjects for experimentation and then what well they were beaten they were raped they were drugged they were killed they were murdered it starts to get really dark that's where it separates my interest in all of the other stuff it has its dark moments right but it doesn't get like this this is something else this is so dark that now you're looking into proverbially looking into the abyss and you know what happens when that happens. So I end up thinking I'm going to make this documentary in two years. That's a reasonable time to make a good documentary. I don't know about these other things that people toss out, but if you want to make a really good movie, you've got to give it time. And so I figured I'll be done with this in two years. And it's, you know, 10 years later and I'm already working on remaking it. Like I became so obsessed with it because of how far it goes, right? Because of how deep it went and, and it did start to affect me to answer your question. So I go to um, St. Joseph, Michigan to visit Stuart Swerdlow to interview him for the first time. And I have John David Brody with me and John was really deep into this stuff eventually, and I'm not going to get too personal about him, but it affected his life to its utmost detriment. You know, he got very sick. And I'm at the Swerdlow's for the first time. I went back many times after that. I ended up living in St. Joseph, Michigan for two years after that. But so I go back there. I go to the Swerdlow's, and at first I'm listening to his stories, and I'm like, I don't believe a word he's saying. Then... You know, John is like, listen, you know, we're sitting back at the hotel and I said, something's wrong, man. He's like, what's wrong? Oh, wait, I know what's wrong. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're having your paradigm shift, brother. It's going to be OK. And by the end of the weekend, after hearing all this stuff, somehow it rang a bell and I started to believe, wow, wait a second. I had this big revelation that a lot of what we've been told is a big lie, one giant manipulation. And for a, a moment, you know, it really did affect me. And when I say a moment, I would say for a couple of months, I started to feel a little ill because I was like, how could this be? 
how could how could we be deceived this bad? How could this happen? And it really uh, put me in a depression. And I think from there I started to now all, all my you know all of these possibilities are true. We are being mind controlled by some alien race. We're doing it, and I really believed all of it. And when I finally reeled myself back in, and you have to, I promised myself I would never, my feet would never leave the ground again, ever. Now I'm only going to pay attention to facts. Now I'm only going to be, I'm going to be very sober about this. If I'm going to pursue this, I'm not going to go nuts. I don't want to go nuts. I want to, I want to examine this stuff. And I want to keep my feet on the ground no matter what. And I've kept my promise since because unfortunately, you know, what happened to my friend was not good. He, you know, he dove way too deep and people get very sick. And so you can still achieve this. In other words, you could still achieve the same goal. We could still reveal this stuff. We could still find the villains in the situation. We could still fight back and resist. If there is a lot of mind control happening, we can resist it but you've got to keep your feet on the ground. You've got to go very slow through something like this because it's not like exploring the North American Sasquatch. That is only dangerous. Let's say you encounter one <laughs> by chance that is absolutely brutal and dangerous situation physically, but it's not going to mess with your mind like this situation. When you start unpeeling something like this, I think it's even designed to hurt you as you go, if I'm making any sense right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. James, your thoughts on that? Yeah, anytime you research anything, especially if it's a dark subject, it's going to have a profound effect on your life. Yeah, yeah, and especially when uh, it involves I murder. Used to think that, uh, I used to think that the government was us you know we're the people the government of the people for the people <laughs> by the people it, it turns out it's a bunch of elites that uh, they're in it for themselves i used to think that those guys with the white coats and the stethoscope around their oh. neck were there to keep us healthy and alive well i keep hearing these stories about these they're in it to make a buck and that's it uh was that guy that was treating people for cancer that didn't have cancer that made 16 million dollars of course now he's got 45 years to think about it in prison but that's one guy got caught but as because i do all this research into conspiracies and things uh you kind of get to a point where you're constantly you know <laughs> you sleep with a gun by your bed uh things like that just because smart thing to do yeah, but just because you know, uh, a lot of people out there, I find it, you know, I forget, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about what to do in an emergency medical situation. I was a paramedic, but I don't realize just because 99% of the people out there haven't a clue what to do. You know, if it's bleeding, make it stop. If the guy's not breathing, get him to go. And uh, simple things. Uh, somebody comes at you with a knife. What do you do? And I, I'm always amazed when I find out that most people out there haven't a clue. But as I do all this research, it's like it changes your way of thinking. It changes your way of looking at the world. It changes the way you move through the world. Because most people don't look at everybody out on the street. Is that guy going to try and mug me? Is that going to is he going to try and steal my wallet? Most people aren't that way. I I'm not that paranoid. I don't think, but uh, there are certain things I don't leave home without, mm -hmm. uh, just because I've done a lot of research and it. Uh, you, the guys with the mask. Oh. Yeah. I like to ask them, oh, what kind of gun do you carry? What do you mean? Well, you're protecting yourself from germs, but what are you doing to protect yourself against the, the crazy guy with a knife? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, right right here on 6th Street. It's been about two or three years now, but there were some people that had come down from, like, I think there was, like, Hershey, Pennsylvania or something, and they were 
it was a, it was a couple and they were walking and there was a cra- and this happened in front of two of my friends who work at nightclub so they still they're the heads of security um one of them just does it part time he's a, a boxing kickboxing coach and then the other one is runs a bar um but they they were you know standing at their at, at the doors of the, the, the and this this couple was walking and this crazy dude was walking he was dressed all in camouflage <clears throat> he puts down his backpack pulls out a big you know knife nine inch knife and just plunges it into this guy's chest and there was this was like a couple in their 60s you know and th- they were just like why what the heck happened why is this guy doing this and when the police he just stood there quietly and you know when the police came he said well i thought he was the antichrist but you're gonna have to listen to me now mm-hmm. um i'm from the future and i got the wrong guy so let me go ahead and go so i can go kill the right guy <laughs> and he was just out of his ever freaking loving mind ever his freaking mm-hmm. cotton picking mind the guy was just out of it and so they said this guy you know i mean and now think about it i mean i'm not gonna say now i have said some things on my show and i've said this and i'll stand by this i believe in the second amendment i am a gun owner responsible gun owner but i also think that there should be some psyche valves done for people i really think that there's some people that shouldn't have them and i don't think 18 year olds are should be in the category of having a gun because mm-hmm. I don't think you're old enough to be done. And honestly, I think 18 should be the limb, the, the, at the time you should be allowed to drive. I really do. I do. How, I just, uh, you know, how old should you be to get a cell phone? I wish it was 30. <laughs> <laughs> Cause people driving around in their vehicles. I saw this lady the other day, she was doing this. She was combing her hair and she was using her knee. And I was like, Oh, Oh, this woman's gonna because she was doing, you know. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Oh man, I get so aggravated. I get so within aggravated. two decades, they're gonna have it programmed in their bodies. Yeah, they, they we right won't there. be carrying these things around. Yeah, or Neuralink. Yep, Neuralink. something like that. Whether it We've be that brand, that. yeah, or some other brand. What was the movie? Happened. The the president's psychiatrist, uh, James Coburn. He oh, was hired. He was hired to be the president's analyst because the president had all these things going on in his life that were getting to him. And it turns out that the phone company were trying to implant a telephone inside people's brains so that all you had to do is think of a number and you could call somebody. Oh, that's Neuralink. You can do that. <laughs> that yeah, was the, the phone company were the bad guys. And it, yeah. was, it was one of these really weird... Uh, movies i can't remember what year it came out but yeah james coburn he was the the president's analyst i think i think that was his call like yeah it's been well, a while. Again, something prophesized and but again, now they're going to put they want to put a cell phone connection inside people's brains when when i was making strange world one of the episodes we went to a lab in boston that was financed by the government and one of the experiments i did was a vr situation where i could have telekinetic abilities inside the VR world by thinking about it. So they were working with the government then. It is now 2024. What is it being used for? Well, they'll implant that into Neuralink. They'll couple that. You think it, it will happen. You, you'll call something, you'll think of a song, you'll hear it. It'll start there, little, little gimmicky things. And then what else are we going to be able to do? Now, I don't think they'd ever give us that kind of power unless it was in a virtual world. And it'll be so tempting in the virtual world that we'll never want to leave. I mean, but this has all been prophesized in, in science fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it came uh, out in 19, 1967. Right. The president that was young, right? Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's like I said, I mean, it's like they say things 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years ago, and it's already come to pass. Those movies are already happening. They're already yeah. here. Uh, quantum potential. And this is something interesting. My brother, he's big into supplementation and thing. My older brother, and he's always uh, looking for a, a way to, you know, whatever, improve his, you know, mind. And so he told me there was a supplement, and I wish I knew the name of it. I think uh, D, if you're in the chat, that's my brother D, not the other one. 
But if you if you're in the chat, give me the name of it. It's a type of and it's some sort of little powder, a little bitty scoop thing he puts into his drinks and he drinks it before he works out. And it does something to you neurologically and it gives you an edge. So Quantum Potentials asked me a question on here. He's usually in my regular chat on Fridays and Sundays. And Panama Roundtable answered there. I don't know what that is. But Quantum Potential says 44. Okay, over here he asked me if I, I could do 12 reps with 225 pounds. Because that's based on a conversation we had. It says, Josh, can you bench 225 for 12 reps? Maybe more. I bet that's well within your wheelhouse. Yeah, because that's what the little troll that, that said something when I said that I could do it 43 times. I wasn't joking. I wasn't lying about it. So what I did last night, I actually videoed myself doing it. I'll be releasing that video. I, I showed myself doing the incline with the close grip, which is a really hard thing to do. It's harder than the way harder than the bench. And I did it 40 times. Um, pretty clean reps, too. Maybe a couple weren't completely as good as they should have been. Um, but I, I showed the video doing it. I also had a video of me doing 630 with the flies um, on this machine where they just, and we loaded up 12 plates. We did the math on the, on the weight of the bars. So it was 630 pounds and I did three sets of five wow. clean. Um, and so then I videoed that. And then I took a video of me hitting a speed bag and a water bag and then throwing kicks. I haven't released all of those, but I did do, I did release the speed bag. Anybody could hit a heavy bag. I mean, who is this going to prove anything? But anyway, this, what I thought about was my brother had this powder and he said that it, it would make your bench, every, everything you do, your squats, um, better because it neurologically. So what it does is I think if I'm not mistaken, it clears something out of your way that tells your body not that you can't basically. And it's based on the pain that you feel and the tightness and everything. And you're a workout guy, Chris, you know that. Um, and what it does, you know, it's the lactic acid, but it basically tells your body you don't, you're not feeling it. Well, so, you can take beta alanine and that would, that helps. That yeah. would do, yeah. And, but you could also take a pain kill, a pain reliever and you won't feel, but then you could really overtrain and hurt the hell out of yourself. Sure. And I, I knew guys back in the day that were just absolute beasts, big monsters. Uh, one of my friends, Chris D, he was like that. And he, him and Mitch uh, W., and they would take uh, ibuprofen in the lift. And I would be like, dude, you guys can hurt yourselves. And they were just absolute beasts, way stronger than me back then. But they also took steroids. That's why I'm not saying their last names. But um, they would take all kinds of stuff, DECA and Winstrol. I never did. And eventually, I outpaced them and became stronger. I've never taken steroids and barely took any, any sort of other than creatine, HMB. But it's amazing what you can take. It, it, it all begins up here, cerebral. And the mind tells you, you can do it, you can do it. And when I lift, that's one of the things I do. So I'm answering the question here, quantum uh, paranormal roundtable, 44 reps, 225. Yep, that's it. So 44 reps I did yesterday. And the pain was absolutely intense, but I kept going because, well, if you want something bad enough, you can do it. And I really think that the mind, I always believe this, the mind controls the body, not the body controls the mind. And I think that the spirit, your spirit, your your soul, how it, it, it houses the, the the master cylinder. It is where it begins, and it teaches the, the brain, and then the brain schools the body, and your body delivers. You know, I really believe that's how it works. And I think that one of the things I was listening to a show one day with Linda Monhow. She's got a really good show. Um, she talked about my book one day on her show about a month or two ago. It's a pretty interesting show she's got. But she was talking about, um, like, where, like, I forgot how she was wording it, but it was like where we are right now and where we came from. And it was these stargates, these, the, these potential places. And, of course, they use these places wherever these jumping off points are for these beings so that it's convenient for them to come in and out of these facilities where they do this work, right? She was talking about how there are several different stargates that you could see the, the, the remnants of that they don't use anymore. They're defunct. But uh, 
one of them in particular, somebody was remote viewing. I believe this was what she was talking about. Somebody remote viewed one in like the Andes or something. And they said that there was a being that came out of there and communicated with this remote viewer. And the remote viewer asked the question about this particular Stargate and said, what, what is the purpose? And so this being says, we, according to this is what the, the story was that Linda Moen was reading. And it said that we are the, the um, basically a, sp a spinoff universe that they created. And if I remember correctly, I, I heard somewhere, and, and she may have talked about it there too, but don't quote me on that. But there was somebody I remember on Coast to Coast or something, and they were saying that for, to them, it had only been like 80 years or something that this universe had been alive. And, and for us, it's been billions of years because the time is accelerated. And they they made it that way so that they could come in and out and take a look at what was going on. Because the whole point of the project for these aliens, the whole point of all of this big mess, the, the MK Ultra, every single thing that's gone on and has gone on and will go on, is all just one giant experiment. Okay, I'm not saying I believe this. I'm saying this is what they said and that the whole purpose was to discover what consciousness is, what its purpose is, and to try to understand and perceive what we are and who we are and using us as the, 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 the study to study. I mean, it, it makes sense, I you know, because a lot of things just don't make sense. But the more elaborate the thought of it. And, you know, the thing is, we're, people are so arrogant that they don't want to believe that we could be simply just pawns in a, in a chessboard, you know, or that we're just an experiment. They don't want to believe that. And that's what keeps them from opening their mind to what you just said. A lot of people, some people are open to it. Mm -hmm. It's no slight on my ego to realize maybe we've been pushed into something, you know. The thing is, I... You know what what's the next stage of all of this is it falling apart for them or is that why we're discussing this right now i do question these things like we're able to discuss this right now to keep an open mind and actually bring up facts a lot of these mind control programs were facts they're not speculation montauk we've been unable to prove 100 percent just yet but all of those other ones that are might as might as well that they're exactly the same you can say it everything from Holmesburg prison to MK ultra to all of the other experiments that we've been able to prove, uh, did happen. 100% governments don't deny it. You know, they'll play it down. They'll water it down when they explain it, but we've been able to prove it. So, um, it's, I guess it's what you're willing to accept and then go forward. And what happens when we declare that we are a part of a major experiment right now, how do you fight it? That's the next question. How do you yeah. fight it? Do you fight it from within? Or do we get together and there's just one big massive revolution? Uh, you know, that, those are the questions. Yeah, I, I think that that is, you know, I, I, I had a story from a guy from Iraq and, and, I, and I did it on the show and he talked about seeing these dog men, you know, standing at attention, kind of like soldiers at, outside of this portal this shimmering portal thing and this giant lizard guy comes out of it and you know and he's sitting there going like what in the hell am i looking at and then later and, and he told me this recently he said that um it was basically like let me take this comment down real quick hold on so so he told me that, that he found out that his whole unit, there were only two people that were not clones that hadn't been in on it from the very beginning. And so according to him, he's in trouble, but he does live off the grid and he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, you know, and so I was kind of waiting for the guy to be like, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm Reacher. I'm Jack Reacher. You know what? I <laughs> just beating people up and, you know, kicking ass and you know, I don't have a home and he didn't say anything like that. But he did say that he wasn't going to be able to contact me anymore because he was nervous, you know. Um, and I would think, okay, you're out of your freaking mind. You're cuckoo bananas. If this was five years ago and I was just starting out and with the show, 
and I hadn't gotten stories like that, but I've gotten a few. Another guy from Iraq had told me, it was back when I had my former co-host who was in Iraq and he was in the military for 11 years. He was a 16 or 16 years and he, he passed away from the, the, the vid. But when you think about these people, when they gave us these stories, they weren't trying to BS us and they weren't even trying to get their names out there. They were just trying to tell us what they saw. And this guy said the first thing they did was push to the museums. That's where mm -hmm. they went. That's the first thing they did. And then they went to the library to retrieve something. And so you're asking the question, why? Why is that so important? Of course, it's ancient Mesopotamia, which was the inheritors of the kingdom of Samaria, which is where the tablets were written that Sitchin talks about so much in his work and the Anunnaki, who they were. You have eight kings that, that reigned for 241,000 years. And uh, they're like, well, wow, how could that possibly be? But only eight guys ruled. You know why? And it, it's explained in the yugas. You know, the, the Hindus explain it very clearly. I mean, it's like you have four yugas. You have four yugas. Uh, the Kali is what we're in right now. The last one was the Dwarpa. And the one before that was the Tetra. And then the one before that was the Satra. The Satra was where everything was almost perfect. And you had lifespans of 100,000 years. The second one was the Tetra. You had lifespan of uh, 10,000 years. And then the last one was 1,000 years, which the Bible bears that out. When you look at Methuselah and Noah and how long they lived, you know, eight, 900 years, whatever. And then the flood came. And then our lifespan, every time it was reduced, you know, 10, 10, 10. And now we're, we're only living to be, what, 100? We top out at about 100. And, and it makes sense. And then when you, but when you go back and you look at how big people were too, they were much bigger and everything was done by the force of power of will, but evil crept in. And so every yuga, you had goodness at nearly a hundred percent in the Satya Yuga, hundred thousand years because death is the wages of sin is death, right? <clears throat> it all ties in the second Yuga, the Techa Yuga. And that was very important because that is when morality was reduced by 25%. So that basically one in three people was bad. Then you had the Dwarpa Yuga. Then it was 50-50. You might meet a good person. You might not. Two out of four people are bad. And now we're down to the Kali Yuga, which is the destruction, the age of destruction, the age of nothing. It's the end and the nothingness, right? And morality is reduced again, and we're down to 25% morality. So think about that. Or is it that everybody on the earth is only 25% moral? You know, there's different ways to look at it. But we're bombarded with evil, and people wonder why. <clears throat> the ancient texts tell us why. It's in the Vedas. Is it? It, based on that pattern, will it swing in the other direction, so to speak? You know, will it be the antithesis to what we're experiencing now? Because how much lower are we going to get at this point? Well, I, do you want the good news or the bad news? Both. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with the good news. The good news is, yes, the Kali Yuga does come to an end. The bad news is it's 432,000 years long. <laughs> And we're toward the beginning of it. We're only like 6,500 years in. So we got a long ways to go. But according to the Hindu tradition, Krishna, which is this Christ-like messianic type figure, which many people could, could say that that is their name for Christ. Now, once again, this is what they believe, not what I believe. And my enemies love to point out the fact that I talk about witchcraft. Because this stuff we're talking about, this is apparently witchcraft because... Well, they're ignorant dumbasses, uneducated and illiterate. And yes, I called you dumbasses, and you know who I'm talking about. So th the thing is, you know, that the truth be told. I mean, that is what is happening right now. Krishna is going to marshal his forces when he comes to earth because his father, who is Brahman, is, is, is basically going dormant, which is their way of, he, it's the cycle starting over again. 
It is also the easiest time period, according to the Hindu Vedas, it is the easiest time period to repent. Because there's so much evil around you, all you have to do, according to them, is accept Krishna. As, you know, basically saying, I believe in you and this and that, and you transcend. It's the easiest time period to transcend. And you will be spared coming back on the will of Dharma. The punishment is that you continue to come back again and again and again. And it gets harder and harder and harder to, to get off. And then what happens, eventually, you reincarnate and you're basically living in hell on earth. Because this becomes hell on earth. And then you're stuck. You're stuck on the will of Dharma until the end of this cycle, which goes on and on and on for what would feel like an eternity for a being that just keeps coming back for 80 years, 80 years. Um, so that is their hell, basically. And it is going to become hell on earth. But we as Christians, me, who I believe, Christ returns, much like Krishna, and he sets everything right. And then we have a thousand year reign. Now, people will ask this question. That's only a thousand years. The Kali Yuga goes on for 432,000 years. Simple answer to that is that one year, one God year to the, to the Vedas is 365 of our years. So a thousand year reign is a 365,000 year reign. Then after that thousand year reign, there's this period where the devil is loose, whatever, and then it's all it fights, some more stuff happens, and then it does its, you know, what has been done before will be done again. And then it kind of rounds it out, and you know, God is lifted back up, spirituality is restored, and we start all over in a golden age of a new yuga, the Satya Yuga. And we are given God-like bodies by God, by Christ. So we can be like him and we can live for 100,000 years in those bodies if we so choose. Now, that is how it works. 4,320,000 year cycle. It's in four parts. And it happens over and over and over and over and over again into infinity. Now, here's what I'm going to say about this. Brahma actually dies. But he doesn't completely die. It's like he goes dormant. Now, people will say, but the Hindus have a million gods. Yes and no. Every god that they have, that they observe, is actually just Brahman. It's an aspect of Brahman. And get this. There are actually 32 that are the main parts of him. And then everyone else is kind of like an offshoot and a descendant or whatever. It's a thought form that came from him and his descendants. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Funny because 32, when they break down the personality disorders in the MK Ultra experiments, one of the things, and Chris, you know this, they said that they could break it down 32 times into 32 different multiple personalities. That was a number that came up over and over again. Now, funny because supposedly that's that that corresponds with what the Buddhas would call the Godhead. The supreme God, you know, um, also in Hinduism, the 32 mounted whatever of, of Brahma, but each one has its own like 320,000, you know, different versions of whatever. Um, so it's all really just, re it's all a matter of perspective, right? Uh, you also look at this number coming up again, two different things. The Arabs, they had a belief that there were 230 different gods. But some people challenge that and they say that's not correct, that those numbers are inverted and it's actually 320 different gods. And Allah, because they kept the lunar calendar, he was the god of the moon, so that God to them became, they, they elevated the moon god as the, the main god. And so he became their, their main god. So that number comes up a lot. And I do, I do also notice the number seven comes up a lot in all these different uh, religious texts. And then, of course, the number uh, eight, which is an infinity number. And then, of course, uh, 365 comes up a lot because if you break it down by the solar calendar, we have 365 days. So that that is what's going on. You know, like there's some some truth to all that that could be relevant to what we're dealing with now. 
But it is interesting because if you flip 32 into 23, 23 is a very powerful number. And then there's a lot to that number too, a number 23 also. Um, and it is an unstable number in the way that the number five in the numerology and life path numbers, five represents, an, you know, a restlessness, an adventurous, whatever, and a not knowing. Um, so there's that. What is your birthday, Chris Garitano? What is yours? July 7th. July 7th, 1976. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's do it really quickly. I could do it. Seven, seven, which is 40. Oh, you got a 14 right there because you're, and I'm July 14th. Um, so we're one year apart. I'm one year older than you. Mm -hmm. And then one is, so that's a five. And then one is six plus nine is 15 plus six, seven, 13 equals four. Oh, you're a one. That's why you're the way you are. <laughs> Let me add it up again, just to make sure. You said seven plus seven plus one plus nine plus seven plus six. Yep, three plus seven equals one. You're one life path, my friend. One life path. There, you. That's you. That's what you are. You're very. You don't. You guys. Ones can do a lot of things. They're usually leaders, and if they're not leading, they don't really follow. They look at trends and then they see how they can affect them and change it. Yeah. Um, read about ones. Ones. My my friend Heather Hamilton. She's one of my. Well, now she's Heather uh, Lucchese, but she's one of the smartest uh, people I know that doesn't apply it. It's unfortunate, but she does a lot. Yeah, Scorpio just said natural leaders. Yeah, people will follow you when you're a one. She has a business and she's very driven and she has a vision of how she wants things to be done. And that's what she does. The problem with ones, though, is they're not good at taking advice. That's a problem. Uh, my number is a seven. I'm a seven life path. And that's a spiritual leader. It's very, very spiritual teacher slash leader. But we can also be stubborn. Um, what is yours, James? What are your numbers? Four, eight, 19, 58. You don't look old enough to be born in 1958. Hey, I remember watching the uh, Apollo 11 maybe land on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> I was about and, to say, with Stanley Kubrick, was he there? He and made, you know. I saw JFK get his lose his mind in oh Dallas. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that's horrible. Uh, yeah. A few things like that. Yeah. I remember watching the... You're an eight. Yes. I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the theater. Wow. I did, too, later. But... Like when it, <laughs> no, you, you on its first run, you saw it, right? I believe so, yeah. That's fantastic. First movie uh, I went to, I was three and I saw Star Wars. Hmm. And it, it took me another several years before I ever saw the very beginning. I was like, eight, and I saw that I, I came in the theater when they were in the desert, the two droids. Nice, I think I was, yeah, Orca, I was, that was, I was the beginning movie in the theater. I was a baby, they took me to see Orca. Orca, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a horrible <laughs> movie to introduce a kid to. Look at the look at the blood and guts on this. Look at the oh my what's God. her name loses her leg. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a horrible. A that's horrible. Film, yeah. So so what do you guys think about that? The eight eight life pad. Just to clarify, eight. You will well, never go broke. You'll I know. I I listened to the numbers lady on Coast to Coast one night. Glennis McCann. Glennis McCann. Yeah, that was good. And she said that if you want to always have money. You should keep a number eight, eight in, your, in wallet. your wallet. I've had one ever since. And it's just a, a figure eight piece of paper mm -hmm. tucked away inside my wallet. Here's my one, wallet. One day my wife needed to uh, hand out some money at school for number school teacher or something. Okay. And I gave her all <laughs> my right money. There. There it is. I gave her all my money and I took my dog to the park. And I'm coming back from the park and there's a $50 bill. Laying in the gutter. Wow. And it was an hour after I'd given away my last Michael. dollar. Nice. I think I got That's crazy. That is, that is, you know, I've always kept an eight in my wallet. I, I mm -hmm. learned that years ago. I had a friend that I used to kickbox with. He was from Thailand. And uh, he told me, he says, you know, you should keep an eight in your wallet. And I said, why? What is this? What is this? Some kind of voodoo? You know, I was the same way. Uh, <laughs> and he goes, no, man. He goes, no, no. Eight is the number of infinity. It's, it's, you know, it's prosperity. 
He's like, the number eight is very important in our culture. It's Chinese New Year. They they celebrate the eight, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay. And so, you know, started going through some rough times. I had some problems. And so I put an eight in my wallet just to see what happened. I never went broke again. Mm -hmm. Never get rich. Yeah, you don't always get broke. You can, though. You can, though. And the good thing about sevens is they can gravitate into six and they can gravitate into eight. Sixes are usually good in business, too, and eights are, are very, very, very good in business. And so, you know, I'm able to move back and forth into those numbers. The good thing about a one, though, is you're adjacent to the two, Chris. And adjacent to the two is that twos are very passionate and they're, and they're loving. So you have that, you know. But it's up to you, though. The, the one can also be very driven and cold and ruthless, but that's up to you. I mean – you know, some notable ones, a lot of people will say that they don't know exactly, but they, I've heard it said that Genghis Khan was a one. The Chinese believe that. Um, but there's also d- debate about because the Marquettes didn't keep a written language of whether him and, and Jamuka, his best friend, if they had the, the, the birthdays opposite, you know. But uh, that's another story. When you look at the, this stuff, people, it's really they talk about magic. And I say it's just science that hasn't been proven yet that's all it is sacred geometry and all this other but you know some people are so superstitious and so caught up in their world if you talk about the pythagorean theorem they're like you're a witch you're a witch and you're like good <laughs> grief man it's called geometry they, they obviously didn't go to school enough to learn mathematics you know and, I, and I, I was watching one of these guys one time on their show and they were talking about science which was their version of science. And it was just like, dude, this, these, it was, uh, it gave me a headache because they would not approach anything that would, would, would counter the King James version of the Bible because they are dead set on that. That is the absolute truth and word. And I believe there's a lot of good there, but I also believe it's incomplete. I didn't say it was wrong, but I say it's incomplete. Um, as far as the new, new Testament, the old Testament, I believe is just, it's a history that was written by people who were, were in captivity by the Persians. And of course the Persians from the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians. And so they got, you know, they just did the best they could and they, they recopied it. But then everybody says, well, this is the absolute truth. This is the word. And so they created a monotheistic religion based on several different gods. And I'm sorry, but people get very offended when I say that, but it's the truth. You don't have seven, eight different names. And all these have different characteristics. It doesn't make sense. Um, And I do believe that there was some alien influence there and that there was terraforming that took place. And what we have is us giving like our version of of way we could explain it. And I had a guy, he said, uh, his name's Chris too. Chris Campbell is an old friend of mine, uh, evangelical, but you know, he's a good guy. And we played softball together, played one season, didn't like it. It's a girl sport. So I was sitting there and I was like, what is this, dude? You know, you argue about everything. He was screaming at one of my teammates that the devil hid dinosaur bones to trick people. I'm like, dude, the devil could do all kinds of stuff. He doesn't need to do that. He's a very evil, wicked being that can cause all kinds of problems without hiding dinosaur bones and making some elaborate scheme. That's just ridiculous. So... No, that's my take. <laughs> what do you wow. think, Chris? Oh, in regard to the dinosaur bones? <laughs> I wasn't there when the devil hid them. <laughs> that could be the argument made by anybody. They're like, you know, did this happen? Well, you know what? I heard it. But I is the gentleman there. wolf a real being? We don't know. Well, some people say it is. I saw it. I have to kind of believe. I had a guy telling me that, you know, he's like, I believe in Bigfoot as a flesh and blood being. And he said, but I don't believe in Dogman. And I said, well, I have to believe in Dogman because I saw it. But I don't have to call it Dogman. I could call it Bublish's Fish Eye. It doesn't make it what it, it doesn't matter. It's still there. It's what it is. And he argued and argued and argued. And I said, you're arguing with me about something that I saw. And you're trying to convince me it was a Bigfoot, and it was not. I said, did I get reports of Bigfoot all the time? Doesn't look anything like that. But uh, and what what is your take on that? 
uh, Chris, either one. Um, of you're you. you're citing of the dog man. No, 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 Bigfoot. What do you think? Is it connected to any oh, of this? Oh, I mean, number one. Okay, well, we know it existed in one form or another as a flesh and blood thing because they know of gig gigantic right, right. But you have to consider something interdimensional happening in this world. For instance, my own experience. I'm standing in a my apartment in Michigan some years ago, and uh, I'm looking down the hallway that led to my bedroom. To the left was my office, and I saw a woman walk towards me and then into my office. And at first, at that time, I thought it was my girlfriend at that time. And I was looking at my periphery. I was on the phone. I saw someone walk into my office. And then I got off the phone. I did my eyes never left the office doorway. I walked into the room and there was nobody there. I lived on the fourth floor. There was a blizzard outside. The windows were shut. Then I went into my bedroom where my girlfriend at the time was wrapped up in the blankets, fast asleep for hours. I said, hey, and I know the answer. I, I knew the answer to this before I asked her, but I said, did you just walk into my office? She said, no, I've been asleep for a long time. And other things happened in that apartment. But what did I see? Did I see the spirit of a discorporated human being? Or did was I peering into a parallel dimension where I was watching something happen before my eyes. And other things like that have happened in the past. And it's not an everyday occurrence for me. It's only happened a very handful of times in my life. However, you have credible people throughout history that have seen things, that have experienced things. And witnesses all around the world and all through human history, for someone to deny the possibility that there is another world that's peeking into ours. We don't even know how to explain it 100%, but there is some science that can start to explain it. And all of the experience that people have had, like myself and yourself, why would I doubt that you know, this thing or some things or creatures that people are seeing out there in the wilderness uh, are of some other dimensional pathway? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know the answer. But I'm considering everything because you do have people also for many years that are going out into the wilderness looking for things and they're not finding anything. Mm -hmm. It's always by chance, usually, right? It's like, oh, wow, we, what was that? You know, and um, I mean, when do you know of any group that has gone on one of these weekend trips into the woods that have? encountered a Bigfoot collectively together on any of these trips that you know of, because I could be wrong, but I don't know if, if anybody that's even any modern times, or let's say from the late sixties to now, is there any group that went out recreationally or seriously that ever encountered an actual being? Now I've been out there too. I went out with Joe Stewart and you'll see some of this footage up ahead. Uh, but we didn't see anything. We heard something odd. It's honestly sounded like something was making an owl call and it didn't sound like a man. And I heard owls so many times throughout my life, uh, but we didn't see anything. So I guess your question is, how do I feel about some kind of interdimensional being? I just told you, I mean, I saw something right from some other dimension, whether it be death, as we call it, death, the afterlife or I'm peering into another time period or whatever, I saw a woman walk from one part of my hallway into my office and disappear. And, you know, I wasn't, of course, wasn't on anything. And it's not a, a common thing for me to experience. And there've been many people that have had a very similar experience. And so what are we seeing? So if you can agree that maybe all these credible people throughout history have seen a person, a ghost, if you want to call it that, then why not some other creature passing in through this dimension? So of course I consider that. And it might make more sense. What about you, James? Well, I've always gone with the possibility that the Bigfoot, the dog man, the other things that people run into is a thought form 
being mm -hmm. broadcast by some entities that are trying to scare people so they can feed on that energy. Not all the Bigfoot, not all the dogmen, but that there's an entity out there that takes on that form as its way of feeding. So Is it not possible, Chris, that this could just be some elusive physical creature that that is very conscious that knows about us wants mm -hmm. nothing to do with us and has kept their breeding population very small consciously you know there i know is, they're in different places but yeah there is a creature out there that is a bigfoot it's a big hairy being that lives in the woods but then most people what they're encountering isn't that creature it's this other entity that takes on the appearance of a Bigfoot so that it can scare people and then feed on it. Because too many people talk about how they're traveling down a, a wooded trail and they encounter a Bigfoot and it runs at them and it scares the heck out of them. So they turn and they run. And they're running through the woods being chased by an eight foot tall hair covered creature. And yet they manage to escape. Who can outrun a Bigfoot? You know, lives in the woods, knows every trail, possibly can see in the dark, and yet they've escaped. The only answer could be that the creature didn't really want to catch them. It just wanted to chase them, scare the heck out of them, so that it could get this energy in the form of fear. Uh, I referred to them as oscuros in one of my shows, just as a... Uh, something to call them because you know we don't know what they are we've never actually seen the actual creature we've seen what it wants us to see that's so what my it, take on it, it is it some kind of shapeshifter or the I'm trying to think of the dang it what happens to thoughts when you can't think them the <laughs> the not the gnostics that were the in, Gnostic southern, text, yeah. in southern france when they found the those uh the writings in it they referred to these alien beings that were invisible and that eight i think it said it 80 emotions or something like that uh i don't read ancient french but <clears throat> it was something like that and it was in these texts the nal i'm going to call it the wrong thing the nag hammadi that's it, the Nag Hammadi. Almost yeah. called it. Almost called it the Spanish word for uh, the butt. There he is. Na Nagas, Nagas, or Nagas. I, I get that. I get that in my mind, and what pops into my head when I'm trying to do the show is that word. So, yeah, that's the problem yeah. with knowing a little bit of Spanish. You can throw the wrong word in at the right time, but they referenced this invisible race of beings that preyed on fear yeah and the nag hamadis and of course th those are the codexes and, and and the gnostics they were found in 1945 in egypt but that's what you're well, i thought they were i thought they were found in southern france no. i know that that's where they were they were wiped out by the was it the first or the second crusade no it was it was in 1945 no, I mean, I mean, when the Gnostics were wiped out. Oh, the Gnostics were wiped yeah. out. Yeah, but that th there were some people that believed that the Rosicrucians, an offset of the Templars, mm -hmm. actually took them back from uh, Tyree. And that's a whole. That's a whole. That's a that, that's a whole other show right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could get into that whole thing too. I mean, there, there's a the Templars. They run deep, and everybody's mm -hmm. always like, "Well, there's this, and there's that, and there's a temple." You know, the Templars had had different sects and subsects. Like, it's like say if you and I and 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 all all of us started our own little gang, and then one day we did really well and we made money and we had a good time. But then, you know, maybe James says, "You know what? I'm going to part ways with you guys because I'm going to go up into this area and see what I can find." And I'm like, "You know what? I'm happy where I'm at." And then Garitano says, "You know what? I'm going to head south. I'm going to go do and see what's over there." You know, and. You guys take your your respective pieces of the army and you go to, but we stay friends. We stay friends. And you set up your own little feudal kingdoms. You'd kill and destroy what's in the area. You set up your own little bank, you know, 
That's what they did. And so you had uh, several different offshoots of the Templars. It wasn't just one, but mm -hmm. it was the one that went back to France after the wars, the Crusades. And um, that is when they were, they had a lot of money. Very simple explanation. It wasn't really that sinister. The, 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 the truth of the matter is, is the looting and plundering for decades that went on in the Levant the Levant uh, being for the audience that doesn't know what the Levant is. It's really the area that encompasses modern day Israel, Palestine, the, what's part of Palestine, whatever at that time, and for a long time it was called Palestine, now Israel. And then part of uh, Turkey, uh, part of Afghanistan is a little sliver of it, then going down part of Iran, all of uh, Iraq, Syria, Jordan. Um, and then it goes over kind of into Egypt um, and then kind of comes down the Sinai Peninsula and into and most of the Arabian Desert, Qatar, and that area. That is the, the Levant, Lebanon, you know. Tyree at different times has been part of Phoenicia, which is now Lebanon. But it was also the northern capital of what was the remnants of the, of the country or, or the empire of Israel that was destroyed by the Assyrians. And then they were in captivity, and eventually the Babylonians overcame the Assyrians, and then the Persians took them. When you look at the, the map, and I've looked at an ancient Templar map, and it was quite amazing. Um, I, was sent, I was sent a screenshot copy of it um, from somebody, and it could be a fake. I don't know. But when you look at the migration and where they went and what they did, they set up camp all over the place. And the ones in France, which is where we get Friday the 13th, um, they were killed on Friday the 13th. That's why it's considered an unlucky day, because it was unlucky for them. Because uh, Louis the 14th, I think it was, he decided that, well, you have all the money and I want it. So he said, you're witches. And so he killed them. He took it. Um, they were lenders and they, were they committed usury, which was their big sin. And once the crown started borrowing money from these glorified mercenaries, well, that was the beginning of the end for them. Because what do you think is going to happen when the power of the B just takes money? Um, I had a friend named Hawkeye years ago. He's a friend of mine. Uh, good old dude. Cowboy was a skip tracer, a bounty hunter. He lived a very colorful life. And he was also a loan shark. And I needed money to start my security company. And I went to Hawkeye and I said, Hawkeye, can you make me a loan? He goes, how much you need? I said, I need six grand. Get me started. And Hawkeye says, I can't do it. And I said, why is that? You're a freaking loan shark. He goes, exactly. If you decided not to pay me, I can't collect on you. What am I going to do? And I said, I said, this isn't the old days. This is me trying to be a good guy. And he's like, Still not going to do it. Never lent money to somebody that I have to fight, to, you know, just in case, you know. And I said, you know what? I respect that. I, I, I don't hold grudges. I was mad for a little while. But I, and then I went back to post and I thought about it. And I was like, if I was him and Cowboy was his right hand guy and, and he called me up and he said, hey, man, no hard feelings. Me and Hawkeye just, you know, we're business people, man. And well, it'd be real hard if something went sideways. I'd want to stay friends and, you know, and it'd be hard. I said, you're right. I thought about it. You're absolutely right. But he said, you know what I'll do, though? And this is a really nice guy to this day. I'll always remember this. He died back in 2014. Nice guy. He says, I'll make you a personal loan. And you pay me back when you can. No interest. So he gave me, he goes, I can't give you six, but I'll give you three. So he gave me three grand as a personal loan. And I paid it back to him in like six months. And uh, back then, $3,000 is a lot more than it is now. Now you can get a gallon of milk and maybe some Oreos and watch a movie. I don't know. Fill up uh, your tank. Yeah, <laughs> fill up the tank, right? But uh, that's kind of what happens. So when you lend money, you're lending money to the crown. And then the king said, they said, hey, king, are you going to pay us back? And the king's like, mm -hmm. no, I don't believe so. I believe that I will just kill you. And then we'll say you're a witch. So that could have been what happened, or they could have been doing bad things. And then the crown, though, I'm sure was doing bad things with them and probably doing it too. And then said, oh, those guys are bad. And they know stuff about us and we owe them money. So it's convenient to get rid of them. And then we'll tell everybody, um, you know, how horrible they are. 
and then it becomes Friday the Thirteenth. But uh, to, to to explain what what I was the why I was getting into all that is you know when you start going back into history and you start looking at why things are the way they are and where they are the way you know and all this it explains things P pretty it's pretty obvious you know why things are where they're at and, and you know um i think that what we look at is all based on the lens that we look through i mean it's it's very obvious to me some people they really make things a lot more difficult than they need to and it is yeah and somebody said alf alf prime says uh the templars weren't wiped out no they weren't just the ones that went back to France. But you got to remember the monarchies were all in it together. So he convinced six of the Germanic provinces because Germany wasn't a country back then. Germany didn't become a country. That wasn't until you know the, the, the 20th or the 19th century. Germany was like Luxembourg. It was uh, 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 Prussia. It was Bavaria. There were all these different little fiefdom kingdoms or whatever that were or Saxony, that was Germany. Germany was not a country. And Austria, Austria was not a part of Germany. Um, and it was always its own country. So the, the Germanic kingdoms were convinced by the crown, along with a few of the, like the, the Danish and a few others, the, the, the Dutch, you know. Also, Holland is not a country. Okay, it's called the Netherlands, and Holland is a province of the Netherlands. I'm so sick of somebody arguing me that day. They're like, in Holland, it's that whole country, it's legal to smoke pot. And I said, yeah, that is not true. And the guy argued back and forth, back and forth. I was at a smoke shop. Well, that's where you find all the smart people, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, look, I said, finally, I just said, okay, look, dude, the reason your statement is incorrect is because Holland's not a country. And he goes, it's not? I said, no, it's not. He goes, oh, it's in Belgium, huh? I said, yeah, sure, whatever. You're right, exactly. No, Belgium is a, is adjacent to it. It's in between there and, and, and France. But Belgium, somebody asked me the other day about Belgium. That's another one. They said, does Belgium have a language? I said, yeah, it has three of them. And they said, do they speak Belgian? I said, there's no Belgian. Okay. They speak Dutch and German, predominantly Dutch and German. And they speak some Danish. And but it's it's one of those in between countries, kind of like Austria is in between Germany and Italy. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of northern Italy and a little bit of southern Germany. But these countries, those little in between countries, that's where you can find the true culture because you'll see that they'll always speak two to three different languages. Um, but Austrian does have a language. Also, they speak German, but there's different dialects of German. But th this whole the whole thing, you know, like the, what we're talking about the Nag Hammadi, when the Templars took those files back, those scrolls back to, to France, they were seized. They had, they were in possession of them. And of course it didn't fit the council of Nicaea. And they were like, what is this? We can't, we can't have this. These, this is her heretical. These teachings say things that don't go along with what we believe now. And the Bible which is the word of God, because the Catholic church says so. The funniest thing to me is when Protestants will rat, you know, just rave and rave and rave about that King James version being the correct version of the Bible. But then when you say, what do you think about the Catholics? Oh, I hate them. They're not correct. The Catholics are idolaters. The Catholics are blah, blah, blah. I said, what if I told you the Bible that you're reading from is their creation? Completely a Catholic creation. They put that Bible together. The Pope himself approved it, put his stamp on it, and said, this is now the word of God. Except there's even more missing from the KJV than there is the Catholic Bible, like the book of Tobit. That's not in the Bible. In the, in the, and, of course, there's a lot of other doctrines that are in there. But the Nag Hammadi is 136 codices that were found in 1946 in Egypt. And I believe that it was in... Uh, Eastern Egypt, I want to say. I think it was in southeastern Egypt. I could be wrong about that, but that's where it was found. And those turned religion kind of on its ear. And then we're mm -hmm. told about the beings and all these different things. Look at the Gospel of Thomas. That one is a really peculiar book. I mean, in that one, Jesus as a child, I mean, he's a very precocious child, and he's smart. He's already aware that he's different. But he actually pushes his playmate off of a roof and kills him. 
<laughs> and then people come to him and they're like, Jesus, what did you do? Why did you do this horrible thing? And Jesus says, boof, what? He's alive. No harm, no foul. He's alive. <laughs> and the argument between scholars is, if this is true, why did Jesus do it? Well, it's very simple for me. And I argued this, you know, when I was in this uh, Bible school, when I was a young man. And they got really mad that I read this. I got caught with a copy of the Gospel of Thomas, and I got corporal punishment. Um, got licks, but they called it getting spanked, and they got trashed. They burned it right in front of me. And I uh, got accused of everything. Heretical, whatever. My parents called call my parents. I had a book about dinosaurs. They took that, too. Um, tore it up, whatever is a Christmas gift. When you learn things correctly, there's always going to be ignorant people who push back with their defiant willful ignorance. I said this, the teacher, when she questioned me, we didn't have teachers because we were learning from the Abeka school, which was on video, a VHS types from uh, Palmdale, Florida, or wherever the Pensacola, Florida, whatever. And so it was cutting edge at the time, right? So we had teaching monitors. And so this teaching monitor who snatched me up and says, you're over here and you're talking crazy. She took me to what they called the prime principal. And he asked me, he says, he's a nice guy, his brother Jim. And he says, Josh, why do you continue to ask questions? You shouldn't question God. I said, I'm not questioning God. I know I was gonna get my ass beat. And I said, I'm questioning man's interpretation of God. And this guy, he's like, he sat back in his chair and he was like really, really heavy, obese guy, but nice, really nice guy. And he says, look, we've already been over this. He's like, we have a curriculum that we teach. The Gospel of Thomas is not a part of that. It never has been and never will be. He's like, and you brought a copy of it here. Where did you find it? And I, this is what I told him that really, I said, in the church library. <laughs> and he was just, he goes, Really? And I, I really shouldn't have told him that because there were other codices in there too. The Apocryphal of Paul and all this other stuff. And they went in there and they took them all out. And they, you know, mm -hmm. and I told him, I said, look, it's in your, on your school grounds in the library. I didn't go to some satanic bookstore to find this. As a child, I wouldn't have known where to go. And I just said, look, man, this is, I didn't get it at Walden Books. This is where I got it. And he says, what did you learn from that? And I and so I told him, and I've been doing this since I was a kid, and I stood up and I said, look, I know I'm going to get spanked, and I don't care. My dad hits me every day because he's mad about the Cowboys losing. I don't give a crap. I said, the bottom line is, Thomas mirrors <laughs> Lazarus. He goes, how is that? Jesus didn't kill Lazarus. I said, I know he didn't. But he didn't run and jump when they came and told him that Lazarus was dying, and then he died. So when Mary Magdalene said, hey, you know, go get Jesus, Jesus took his time. And they were like, Lord, why do you tarry so? And he's like, why do I need to hurry? He'll be fine. But he cried. He cried because he was a human and he was crying because of the emotions of this man's sisters and how heartbroken they were. And he felt that humanness in him because he was the word made flesh. He was a human and he cried, too. And then he stopped and he said, don't cry because I can do this. And he called him forth. And of course, I read that when my mother died, I did the eulogy. And there's a verse in there where he talks about, oh, death, where is thou sting? Like he's taunting death, like you have no power over me. And of course, when Christ dies, he goes to hell for three days. I can't do three of my boxing fracture. <laughs> And he says, you know, for three days, and he wanders into hell, and he takes the keys of life and death from death itself. And now he has power over the life and the death, and he says, I am the way and the life, and if you believe in me, you will not die. You shall not perish. Prior to Christ, and we know this from the Epic of Gilgamesh, do you know what the Epic of Gilgamesh says is the big reward if you were lived a righteous life and you died? It is to sit at a table with your friends, and the best you could hope for was to eat ash. Now, think about that. 
we die. We lived, we, we did good. We didn't go to hell. So we sat in this purgatorial type state and we just ate ash until somebody comes and says, Hey, you're living eternal life. You'll go to the kingdom of heaven where you belong. And that man was Jesus. So people really, really, really do not understand because they haven't read and they don't grasp. And I'm not telling you to believe everything that you read. If you read a comic book about Iron Man, does that mean that Tony Stark is real? No. Okay. Some things are just what they are. They're just fiction. They're not real. Stranger things. Fiction. This is stronger things, but still, you know, Chris, your information that you did was nonfiction. I believe it. I believe it's real. Then you did South Texas blues and that's fiction. And that's great. No, too. Actually, it's not. It's a true story. Well, about, well, it's it's yeah. um, not the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is fiction. Let's put it that way. It's based on a fictional movie. Let's put it that way. South Texas Blues is what happened on the set of the actual film. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's a historic yep. event. So, so I'm it, wrong about that, but it, it's based on fiction. It's done through way. a very stylized lens. Like, yeah. um, how else do I explain it? I, you know, in a shorthand, I can compare it to, let's say, like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas or. Mm -hmm. Natural Born Killers, where those elements are very real, but this is done in a very stylistic lens. And that's what it attracted this network to it, you know, or the, this group that I'm working mm -hmm. with now. They really love it for those reasons, not just it being a biopic, you know. Y your show straddles the line between fiction and reality, right? That's kind of what it does. Your uh, show often you mean that? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the theme of everything I'm writing, even the fiction that I'm writing. It's it does the same. It's my eternal interest, because I just think that, um, you know, we live on that borderline. All of the things we're discussing, we grew up with these things as fiction in a way outside of a few unexplained mystery type books and, and, and very sparse programming that was on television. Um, it was mostly in our fiction. And uh, now, you know, that that dam has burst and there are people like we are right now into the wee hours of, well, you know, into the witching hour uh, that uh, we're talking about this stuff and we're talking about things that actually happened, which are these government programs. Those have been proven to be true. And now we're, you know, the rest is conjecture. We're saying, OK, I had an experience. You had an experience that is tantamount to fiction that we've read. I read ghost stories and fiction all the time. I'm writing them. But I had an experience that could have easily have been in one of those Stephen King books. You know, so did you. I mean, you you had a silver bullet type experience. Cycle of the Werewolf was the name of the yeah, book. It was the original book, yeah. Yeah. And you had an experience that's kind of like that. You know, other people have too, or they claim to have, right? We can, you know, just like the, I believe the Montauk Project happened. Can I say I it happened 100% truth? No, I can't. Now, I, I luckily I had resources uh, much more than I did to make Montauk Chronicles to make a two hour special for History Channel called The Dark Files. Well, we were able to hire geophysicists, went to the ground. They used something called electric resistivity imagery, looked into the ground and proved that there was some a, a huge man made structure. They found iron ore, which is rebar, and it is a huge structure underneath the ground. The 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 facilities caretakers and local government did not allow us to use that technology in the way I suggested. And the way I suggested it was we needed to get close to the tower. We needed to go the entire perimeter and probably spend a week doing it. So if someone can get electric resistivity imagery and use it at Camp Hero around the tower, around the, the, the SAGE radar tower, sem semi-automatic ground environment radar tower, you will find the rest of this because what we found is just one vertical slice. And you'll see it if you go watch the dark files, it's available just about anywhere. Um, and that's what we found in that short period of time. So if someone were to get, because so many people are talking about Montauk online and on YouTube and stuff, and it's like, look, pick up where we left off with the dark files. I'm done with that at part of my investigation. The, the thing I'm offering now, and we've been talking about fiction, is a book I've been writing called Montauk Boys. But there's so much in it that I believe people will be reading it for many years to come, kind of 
looking to see what I hid in there because it's everything I picked up well over a decade of looking into this, almost 20 years looking into this thing is in that fiction story. You know, there's a lot of truth in there. So that's what I decided to do as my last jump on this, because I think there's so many people visiting Camp Hero and looking into it um, that I think, hey, you know, we did some serious research while we were making the Dark Files. Why don't you pick up where we left off, hire a geophysical crew and see if you can sneak onto the base and get the rest of what we started? Because that if you prove there's this enormous structure underneath the ground that everyone said that didn't exist, you've made a major leap. And it's simple instructions, as opposed to saying, oh, well, you, when are you going to find a reptilian? When are you going to find the time travel devices? I was at Preston Nichols' house. You know, I, was, I spoke to these people firsthand. I went all over the place, speaking of boots on the ground. I was everywhere. And, you know, I've traveled from Washington, D.C. to, you know, the Everglades to everywhere where I could find someone to speak to about this stuff. I did it. Went to the Montauk archives at the library, was inside the tower. There's really nothing there but ruins. And so, and I know it's enjoyable to go visit, but you've got to bring this equipment there. You've got to look underneath the ground. That's where we start. If you can prove that facility is there, wow, what a conversation we're going to have after that, you know? You, we're talking about the line between fiction and reality. And what when I was talking earlier, I made the mistake of saying that the book is fiction. The book is based on a fictional event, but the stuff that happened and what they went through was absolutely real. Right. As far as like how they descended into madness because of all the crazy uh, stuff. I have a, a very uh, weird relationship with that movie and with that house. I've said this before. I'll say it quickly here. Uh, my dad's friend used to own it. And then at one time I played in there as a kid with his kids. My dad stayed there a few times. It used to be at the La Frontera Shopping Center in Round Rock, where now my friends have a jewelry store. And at one time when they were building, they were tearing down one of the buildings. And I was I was I had to literally work right there where it was located. I was literally right there and uh, had kind of a weird experience there. I'm not going to get into it. I had a weird dream because I fell asleep. Shouldn't have been asleep. I was doing my job. But I was working 16 hour days every day for like a month and I was just exhausted. And so. What ended up happening, um, I had Eric Palacios from Media Palace on. He makes videos, too, like you do, Chris. He does documentaries. He did the Beast of Brushy Creeks pretty good. And he also, he's a producer at the at the UT Network, whatever. Um, good guy, really good friend of mine, and I like talking to him, you know. And a weird thing happened. We're talking about alien agenda and stuff here. His aunt owned that house at one time. Now it's in Kingsland, and you've been there, Chris, so have yeah. I. And so, but, but at that time, it was still there, La Frontera, and there was nothing around there at that time. Um, it was still kind of tucked back off the highway, whatever. And all that shopping stuff, Coles and all that, Sam's, was not there. Um, but it's been there for, you know, 30 years now, but it, had, it wasn't there then. And then the, the thing about it is his aunt, and his her whole family woke up one night outside of the house. They were all asleep in the front yard. Very weird, very like alien abduction-y, and they had all this missing time. So that's a very weird, odd thing that happened, and he told me about that, and I thought, that is freaky-deaky, man. Um, and then when I talked about that on the show, or maybe he did, maybe it was when he did, because I did a three-parter like I did with you, Chris, and somebody messaged me and said, you know, back in, I think it was in 19, they said it was in 1979 or something like that, that they broke down right there near that house and that they had missing time. And that, that guy told me that another person who was a friend of his had a UFO experience. There. That's really interesting. You know, Gunnar Hansen. And again, everything that's in this book, really, I did a lot of research. I spoke to everybody. So this is a real occurrence that happened there while they were making the movie. And there's a moment where Gunnar Hansen is kind of out of his mind, sleep deprived, uh, you know, because they had that 36 hour shoot at the end that was just mm -hmm. driving everybody crazy. Hansen couldn't change his wardrobe because they were worried that if they brought it to the cleaners, um, you know, they're going to wash the dye out. So he literally stank. 
I mean, like the house stank because they had all this rotten meat on the table. They had yeah. animals decaying, a decaying chicken. It was just nasty. And people were getting hurt left and right, too. So there's a moment where Hanson is sitting on the uh, the front steps, just rocking back and forth, saying, time has no meaning. Time has no meaning. Time has no meaning. And it was during one of those meteor showers that was happening, too. So, again, it's... It's a very stylized, very imaginative version of a very true event that happened. Um, but it makes me think what you're saying is I wonder, because it's such an odd film and they, it's such a chaotic set, but strong artists across the board that worked on it, whether it be Marilyn Burns' performance as, as Sally, that was off the wall, that performance, mm -hmm. or Ed Neal. Or Danny Pearl, who is a cinematographer, Toby Hooper, the director, all these people were huge contributors. I wonder, was there some odd energy about the place that really helped forge the movie? I've always wondered that, you know, uh, because there was a lot of, you know, junky little horror films being made at the time. But for some reason, that particular movie has a, a feeling to it unlike any other. You know, I think a lot of it too. Of course, not taking anything away from Neil's character. My brother made good head cheese. I mean, he was, you know, that that was, you know, he takes the nine, eh, eh, you know. But would you would you look at Leatherface? Like a funny. Here's another funny thing. My grandfather was a retired truck driver. He'd squirreled away a little money, so he opened up a cleaning business. And he his one big contract was UT at UT. Now these were filmmakers from UT. Tobe was there, you know, and of course. The people that that worked on the film, a couple of them were college kids who had said, "Hey, you know, yeah. we'll help you, whatever." Yeah, and so my mother went to work for my grandfather, who was my dad's dad, and um, he he wouldn't he wouldn't uh, him and my dad didn't get along very good. So he was like, you know, my dad was long hair, kind of hippie. My grandfather's like, "No, nah, you're just gonna be smoking dope. I'm not gonna give you a job. I'll give your wife a job." You know, so she went and she worked with my grandfather and grand and grandmother, and she got to meet him. She got to meet Tobe Hooper and then she got to meet the guy that played Leatherface. She was actually a very nice guy. Got her hands. Yeah. 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 And, and she got to play with the chainsaw that they had on the table and the mask and everything. She got to see it. It was really cool. And it's so weird that that whole thing, you know, but if you look at, at the, the guy that, that, that Kansas was playing. This um, was on the yeah. table when they shot the movie. Yeah. One of the props. This was actually there. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you if you look at that at his character, what it was was an amalgamation of of Ed Gein, Albert Fish, mm -hmm. um, real life murderers, real life serial killers, people who did really, really bad things. Yeah, the and, bloody bender family, all of Oh it. yeah, the and then of course you had the uh the guys from Scotland. What were they called? The um the Shawnee Bean clan. The Shawnee mm -hmm. Bean clan, who had supposedly killed and eaten over 50 people. Um, that's a liberal estimate. Some people say it was more, maybe people, more, some, you know, the 30, some people say it was a hundred, who knows, yeah. but they were a clan of, of killers, uh, highwaymen basically, but they, they also ate people. And so it was like the Hills have eyes, Texas style. And of course that gas station, you, you probably met him, Joe Breezy. He works there. Um, he was at our conference, a long haired guy has the contacts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, he sent us some shirts from there, the gas station in Bastrop it's where it was overnight one night. Uh, yeah. Roy, Roy's a good guy that, that yeah. the gas station. Uh, I, I was there I, pretty much by myself because Roy has all these bungalows. And so it's, you know, the gas station where they shot those scenes in mm -hmm. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but and now he has it. It's kind of like a little horror resort. So he, you know, they have a video store inside. They give you a, a movie to watch. Of course, I picked the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and it's kind of cold out, and it, w it wasn't very busy that night. I think maybe one other person was staying the night, and I could hear cows in the distance. And I'm watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> I don't know. It was something else. Could it be that they put so much energy, so much effort into filming that thing. They made it so realistic that they maybe drew something into the house. Right. Like you know, the house maybe wasn't wasn't Think, that yeah, way before. That's a great that's a great perspective <clears throat> because the hours and the intensity. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about something traumatic happening, leaving its impression on a home. Could you fool? the quantum elements into thinking something traumatic happened by staging it. I wonder. 
And I that in, so that way of thinking inspired me to do an experiment for a haunting we will go, which is my new, you know, feature length docu film. I wanted to do something like that. I don't. I mean, I you know, I, there's devices and stuff. It's not a ghost hunting documentary. I could not do that. What a waste of time. No. Uh, so why not appeal to the quantum realm? Like Chris was just saying in a way, could you stage something like really st stage it to the point where you're almost living it like a, like a method actor. And then all of a sudden it makes its impression like a real murder would. I wonder if you can fool the quantum realm. I don't know. Quantum well, you know paranormal. They, yeah. You know how they invented, they invented that ghost. Yeah. The, who was that? They wrote up a script. They said this is what the person is. They knew it was complete fiction, but they wrote this thing out and they said, "Okay, this is the person who lived here. He died here. We are going to contact his spirit." And the next thing you know, they've got this spirit of this fake entity running around the building. Right. Uh, I can't remember when it was done. You're talking about the is it Kevin? No, the what is his name? They they named him. Yeah. The something experiments from Boston College. Yes, uh, that was it. God, what is his? What it? What was it? Kevin or something? And and it actually did take yeah. on. Now, now here's one. Here's one it's for you. Tulpa. Know, oh my God, a tulpa. Yes. Now I would love to get y'all, both y'all's take on this. Very smart guys here. This is something I would love to ask you. There was a Sufi mystic um, who actually claimed to be able to commune with the with jinn and demons because two different things, but kind of the same. But they're in the same family. But according to the Sufic tradition, they're two different things. But there are low-level angels, too. There's all these different things happening at one time. And what happened? Something paranormal? No, no, no. We just knocked a uh, <laughs> book over. Trick or Treat by Lisa Morton. Oh, wow. It hit the ground. So, <laughs> you always got something there, right there. <laughs> so you and Chris have the same – both of y'all have the, all the books and everything. I'm, I'm not in my studies. So I don't yeah, have the same books, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I have, probably we all three probably do. Um, what's crazy though is like you know, the, the Sufi mystic said, "I have." Oh, them. I used to have that whole set. I have them right here. Oh my gosh, I, that brings back memories, dude. Mysteries of mind, space, and time. Yep. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, you buy one every month, and then all of a sudden they shift. Nineteen ninety-five, and then yep. but and then yep. they just give you little teasers, and then you got to oh, go to the wait, library wait, wait. and find did, other people's books. About did them. you have these? The Time Life series? Oh, yeah. The Enchanted World. Yes. One time. Yes. I didn't have that. My best friend did, though, and he, I read all of those. Those are fantastic. Yeah, those are those are great, dude. Oh, I have okay. One of my set, favorite dude. books on your your subject over there, When Roger Met Patty. Did you read yeah. this? Nope. William Munn, special effects makeup artist. All right, he did, like, Swamp Thing and some of Return of the Living Dead. Wrote this amazing, like analysis of the the patterson film the wow. Kim patterson film and it, it's really deep and extensive and intelligent I, it's fantastic he might be a guy to get on on your show yeah yeah there, there's so many people that I've, I've talked to i'm like booked up to like april something or something you know and it's like man i have so that's why i did this because i couldn't do friday like this because it would just go on for months so I had to do a Saturday, which is fine with me. But here's the thing. When, when you look at the, this, what this mystic was saying, and it was it was something, I did a follow-up on it. It was from uh, Phyllis Galdi's, um, she had like this compendium of the best fate magazine articles. I don't remember what it was. And I, I had it. And I think David Weatherly has a copy. He was telling me because I, I, he's the only one I knew had it. No, no, Nick Redfern had it too. But we were talking at the conference and we were talking about it at the first conference. <clears throat> and of course, Chris, you were at the second one, but we were all talking about that. And, and what's crazy is that um, they, they saw the same thing I did. There was, um, there was actually um, a Sufi mystic who claimed that he could, you know, correspond with these different types of entities. And he proved many, many times to his peers that he could do it. And he was challenged by a um, a Sikh um, who, you know, and, and so this guy, Sikhs are known to be very, like, truthful. That's part of their, because if they get caught lying, it could be, like, death. It's not, you're not, it's not a joke. They don't play around. And they're very, very strict about the way that they believe in community, whatever. So that gave this guy some validity. But anyway, 
he 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 said, and this is when they questioned this guy, um, a Muslim cleric questioned him, and, and a Hindu Brahmin priest, both of them. They went to him, and there's a very famous conversation in India. And he said, they said, we want to know what the most powerful beings are. And his answer was was shocking. He called them archons. But his definition of an archon was something that was given life by the human mind. And what he said was very interesting. And he said that these other beings said that, that they cannot compete with that because they have free will up to a degree. But what is created by the human mind, by us, the power that God gave us, is very, very potent. And it could easily take on a life of its own and even begin to wrap around and influence and warp its creator, strangulating him and taking over and becoming what the creator, you know, was trying to achieve. This tulpic entity could even parasitize demons and take energy from them, not the other way around. And it didn't have to answer to anything because it was created by man. Very odd, very weird answer. So I thought that that was very interesting. And there have been many other cases um, that I've read here and there over the years of this being the case, these tulpic entities. And only only the creator can that, that creates it with their mind is able to destroy it or instigate its destruction. Well, the, the, the Montauk chair allegedly was a piece of technology that enhanced the ability you're talking about that you could manifest something into reality. So speaking of like a, a Bigfoot-like creature, Preston Nichols said that Duncan Cameron was in that chair and he amplified. First, they tried to do it with inanimate objects like a ball. Then they worked their way up and they said they were able to manifest a mouse, came into reality, mm -hmm. disappeared. Then it was this thing called Junior, which was, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Bigfoot. the Bigfoot experiment. Yeah. Now, was any of that real? I don't know. I want to first prove there's a base there. Then I want to prove, and I think we're pretty close to it, the collective information that there was an experiment on runaway kids and people were murdered. If you could prove those two things, I'm open to anything else after that. Mm -hmm. Larry Fisher says something interesting. He says, Scripture says we will live forever if we live in Christ. Um, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years, but eternal life, IOS, just that, eternal for no thing was created other than what God created. I agree with that wholeheartedly. One thing, though, about this, Larry, is everything is open to interpretation, and we're all just trying to find the literary, the literation, whatever, the, the, the translation. The one thing I will say about this statement, for no thing was created other than what God created. If we, as men, create something, now listen to what I'm going to say. This is very important. It's a very simple thing. Sometimes the, the, the most difficult things have the easiest answers. We created this bottle. This bottle is glass. We did that. Humans did that. But did God not create us? Or did he create our progenitors? And they created us. And then we created that. Because we can make robots that can make this bottle. So by some people's loose playing with reality definition. Well, God didn't make that. We did. We're humans and we did. So there is no, you know, and they'll say silly things like they don't believe in God. Like it says in the book of Job, the foolish man says in his heart, there is no God. Let me tell you something. There is a God. And I do believe that he created who created us. Therefore, nothing was created outside of him. Because ultimately, even if we were spun off from another universe, right? See, Ultimately, it all goes back to the infinite, one true living God, the Father of Christ. It doesn't matter. In the Gnostic tradition, as Chris James was talking about, they talk about a different type of being, the Demiurge, that was actually set himself up as God and created all that we know here. But he is at the highest level that he could possibly go to, according to the tradition, let's say as me, once again, people are going to take this out of context, but there is something higher than that particular God. 
and he is from a higher level and he is the creator of all of the multiple universes and this god the demiurge is in charge of this universe but and his name is there's different ways to say it but it doesn't matter it's not important i don't want to say it but because people will flip out but god the ultimate creator that created him he created the beings that created us and then we create robots which are ai and eventually the ai could potentially create clones of all of us and that's a whole nother race of beings but it also says in the Bible that what has been done will be done again. It's in Ephesians. Go look it up. And it will happen again and again. So what if this has all already happened and we are literally the clones that were created by an AI intelligence that was created by an alien presence that was created by another presence that was created from the God of the spun off universe that was created by the beings from that spun off universe or that created the spun off universe. Right. And then their God is the real true God. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Just higher levels of beings until you're at the very, very, very final boss, which he's like letting things be because he's a peaceful God. He sent Christ and the Holy spirit here to pull us out of the Kali Yuga and what is to come because he had mercy upon us. And there's condemnation for those who wantonly create an experiment where millions and billions and billions and trillions of beings are just killed like insects in an experiment. Now, the Vedas say that. Is that true? I don't know. But there's some of the old, oldest books on earth you know, that we know of. The Tamil culture that's found in southwestern uh, India is the oldest language on earth. And I argued with another pea brain the other day on the Facebook group. I don't know why I waste my time. But sometimes people say things and they just you just you want to verbally smack them. And this guy's like, no, Sanskrit is the oldest, and blah 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 blah. And he's chastised this woman about the Sumerian culture. And I'm like, that's pretty much the same thing, but splitting technical hairs. And I said, doesn't matter. You're both wrong. The Tamil language is older and it predates it by almost two thousand years. And even that isn't that is a common language from a bygone era, from another bygone era. And this guy says, well, how old do you think the world is? I said, I think it's 4 billion years old. And I think that we as a civilization have risen and fallen about fucking 200,000 times, you know, excuse my F bomb there. I should have said that, but I get aggravated with these people because I'm like, dude, I'm sick and tired of the stupidity and the wanton willingness of ignorance because we do live in a cult of ignorance. And if you're not down with that cult of ignorance, well, you know what? You're a bad dude. You're a bad guy. And we're going to pronounce you a heretic and throw you out the game. Well, the guy that said, hey, maybe we should wash our hands. You know, you don't think maybe that guy didn't catch the same kind of hell because he said there's invisible beings on our hands that can make us sick. And they're like, nope, that ain't what it is. Mm -mm. I'm going to go wipe my hands up my butt and I'm not going to wash them. And I'm going to go eat after I process meat. And nothing ain't going to happen to me ever. And then the guy's laying there dying. A cut scene in the movie would be the guy laying there dying, uh, you know. And he's like, well, I told you there's invisible beings on the hands. And we're sick and tired of you talking about these invisible beings. It ain't nothing on your hands but caca. Okay. That's the point. Right. <laughs> Dealing with a bunch of apes who don't grasp things, you know. Um, and then you spend your time arguing with them. And then who's the bigger ape? You with them because you're stupid enough to give them your time. I mean, but that's it. You know, I just, you know, that was the whole deal. I just, you know, you go round and round, you go down the rabbit hole. Uh, the Montauk thing, when you look at what may or may not be there, when I watched the documentary, what you were doing with that resonance and all that, trying to find, you should have known, like, obviously, I mean, they're not going to let you have the, you know, I mean, obviously. Well, even, so here's the thing. Like, um, I made Montauk Chronicles. Then we developed uh, the Dark Files. That got made. And in between the Dark Files and Strange World, the very first episode of Strange World, I, it was also about Montauk, but the rest of them weren't. Um, in between, I did an episode of Ancient Aliens. That was supposed to be much bigger. And I was supposed to go to Camp Hero with Linda Moulton Howe. 
we didn't we weren't granted the permits because they knew I was coming because the last time I was there I brought geophysicists and we were breaking some rules. So later they gave us permission, but under strict supervision for the first episode of Strange World. That episode of Ancient Aliens that I was on was cut in half. It was supposed to be much bigger. Uh, and we we never got the per they didn't give ancient aliens the permits to do the stuff we wanted to do uh, at that time because they knew I was going to be there. So interesting, right? Yeah. And in, and in conclusion to this, did you like? Do you think? I mean, I mean, thank you. Probably you know you don't know one hundred percent, but I'm sure you think that all of this was done under the uh, under some sort of an agreement with our shadow government that said, hey. You know, these alien presences are here. They're going to abduct us whether we allow them or not. We should just be okay with it and give them people to do these brutal experiments. I mean, what do you think? That's what some people in the situation that I interviewed over the years told me. I don't know for sure um, because I have to keep my feet on the ground with this. You know, other people can, that's other people's job. They can sit and say, yeah, of course it happened. It's like, yeah, but you don't know. I believe, you can say, I believe because, and fill in the blank, but you don't know. What we know is there was a structure above the ground that um, Brian Minnick had pictures of, and there were patterns on every wall. And that was in line with past psychedelic experiments elsewhere where these were not painted by teenagers after the fact these were professionally painted rooms one had a paisley pattern one had geometric shapes on the wall another one was striped black and white and then that entire structure was leveled so luckily we did have the photos that brian had um then we have the geophysicists, which was GeoView from Florida, came to New York when we were shooting the dark files, and they did the electric resistivity imagery. Then we have other witnesses that keep popping up over time. You know, James Bruce, even though, you know, he he has a pretty outlandish story, at the same time, he is in line with people, other people who were in programs where they were damaged and brutalized. And someone who went through a lot is going to have some scars. Someone who was brought to a place, injected with drugs, beaten, perhaps raped, worse, they're going to, it's going to be in them. Like someone who's been to prison for a long time has a, that stare, has that, that there's a, something different about them. And they're worn a little bit. And so, you know, those are the things you should look out for because a lo alongside, just like in any subject, even the Bigfoot thing, and even dogman witnesses, there are liars and hucksters along the alongside the people that are telling the truth, alongside the people that you can trust that they had an experience. There are also liars, and so there are liars attached to the world of the Montauk Project too. They they pop up. Listen, I hear from people, at least for the at least the last decade, a couple of times a month for the last decade, write to me because of the film I made and because of the TV shows I made, and they want to tell their story. Now, I think some of them are being quite sincere. I'm sure some of them are, are making it up, you know, because that's the way it goes with these things. Not everyone's telling the truth. <clears throat> and that, I don't, you know, I don't know what filter you use, Wolf or Chris, to say, hey, wait a second, you know, I'm going to take my time with this. But for me, I don't know. I, I look for something unique I look for maybe a desperation and also a reluctance to tell the story kind of at the same time. And, um, and then I open my mind to what they have to say. The, the liars are usually, usually put it in a pretty package to be sold immediately. I'm not saying we all have yeah. to, agree, but they want their names out there too. Right, a lot of times right. when somebody right. doesn't want their names. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. It's wrapped up with a nice little bow on it and ready to go. Mm -hmm. also, I've seen that story, too. Like, <laughs> their story changes as they keep adding to it. Just a little bit, just a tweak here and a tweak there. They want something new, something extra to be added every so often. So you get these guys that their story is going to progressively get fancier, more involved with time. 
Sure. That's, sure. that's another red light. It's like, and they make themselves into a hero in the story mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've told my dog man story encounter. I told it tonight on Matt Imp show. And, um, I'm not the hero. <laughs> I was definitely, <laughs> definitely trying to not pee and poop myself. Okay. I didn't. Right. Thank God. If but, I saw um, a werewolf yeah. or a dog man, I, I don't know what I would do. I tell people all the time, I am a very big and strong guy. People say, oh, he's always bragging on himself. No, I'm just telling the truth. I'm a big, strong, I'm six foot, almost six four. You've met me, Chris. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah. And I'm like, I'm 400 pounds. I'm about 370, something like that. But when you take, I'm powerfully built. I mean, you can look at me. I look like a lowland mountain gorilla. No, you're a big guy. I'm, yeah. I'm, and and so know, I, I don't, I there's no, under no illusion that I could face a dog man or a bigfoot and survive they would just tear me limb from limb and even then when i tell people that they're like all they get stuck on is like he said he's big he's strong like a bigfoot like never said that you know and but the deliverance people they always you know and then you you have to i'm like look i'm telling you as an example okay i am afraid of them i won't mess around with them now i'm not afraid of them it's like you know I'm not going to go up to one if I see it and get a better look so I can take a picture. I know it exists. I don't need to prove anything to myself. Besides that, nowadays with AI, I tell people, don't risk your life for a photo because it's not going to matter. Nobody's going to believe it anyway. Uh, but you, you're, I'm under no illusion that I could go and, and face one of these things in a, in a physical way. Um, I don't, I don't, um, I, I'm not one of those people. There's some people who think that they, you know, I'm not afraid of Bigfoot and they go walk around out in the woods and they go right up to where that they're supposedly have habitation. Um, and I won't do it. I just, I think that is the, the, the height of ignorance. It's, it's a folly. Um, because you could end up being in a situation where you're facing one of these things. What are you going to do? There's nothing you can do. I noticed Chris, somebody in the, in the, uh, Chris G and uh, somebody in there said something about the Amityville horror house. Remember you were saying it was for sale. Yeah. It keeps, Coming up for see, you know, it makes me wonder. It's like they say, well, the only people that had the experience there after the murders, because the murders really did happen, uh, were the Lutz family. And and George and Kathy Lutz both took that story to their grave. I felt they were being very sincere. Now people get confused because, mind you, there was a lawyer that was cut out of some money that was made from the book and the the movie. So he was bitter and he comes out to get them back and say they're lying. You know, that is that banter back and forth, that fighting, that infighting. But the Lutzes were sincere. You know, uh, Kathy Lutz literally had an oxygen line on her and still telling the same story. You know when someone's being sincere. They And there was no way they they could have banked on abandoning their house after 28 days and leaving everything behind. And what? They were guaranteed this lucrative ghost story? No way. So I, I believe something happened to that family. And um, the thing is, George Lutz kept all of the bed frames where um, Ron DeFeo killed his family, shot everybody in those in those bedrooms, in those beds. And so perhaps that's a reason why other people didn't. But the house keeps changing hands. So And they say nobody's experiencing anything, but sometimes people don't talk. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes people don't want to tell you that they experienced yeah. something. Oh, we have the Smiley, what bad name, but that was his name, the Smiley X Murder House here in Laredo. Mm-hmm. A guy named Smiley got killed with an axe. Oh. And lots of people have lived in there. And nobody's ever reported seeing anything except this one family who they'd rented the place. They were there maybe a year. They got a better house. They were moving out. The guy was sitting in front of his TV. He had just turned the TV off. He sat back in his chair, and he saw somebody reflected in the TV screen walk behind him. And he was the only one in the house. Wow. And that is the only time anything has happened in the house that anybody has talked about. And yet, there were chopped up people all over the place. Sure. TVs so are black mirrors. I mean, there's there's no predicting if a house is going to be haunted and if you're going to see something until it happens. Yeah, I mean that apartment in Michigan was heavy. He- things happened in there. 
And, uh, you know, there are, you know, nothing in, the, luckily in this house, pretty big house too. It's, it, there's nothing, I've never felt a bad vibe here. I'm very happy about that. I would be. So far. <laughs> <laughs> we had something happen in our place not too long ago. And then I find out recently from one of the defectors from the other camp over there, which a lot of them are defecting now because they see how damn insane they are. And they told us that they practice witchcraft and that they had come into our, the, 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 the culprits, the people who are involved in harassing us right now, I'm not going to say their names, but there's two of them in particular. One of them practices voodoo openly. He talks about it. Then he claims to be a real Christian and then he denies it. And then later he says it again. Well, we obviously you said it before, you know, and then one of them um, has talked to multiple people and they've seen a black demonic shadow being um, happened to Bettina, you know, Bettina, she's been on your show, Chris. I don't know mm -hmm. if she's been on your show, Chris James, no. but she'd be an interesting guest to have. But um, it, it had, so it happened to us. I was with Chris Clough and you know him, uh, uh, Garitano. Yeah. So Chris Clough, yeah. Chris is a good guy. We were all there and we were playing Nelly's board game and we were doing like a test run before we sent it to the place to have it finally test run, whatever you got to do these tests to make and then tweak it, you know, Sure. And I look up and as clear as day, I see this black shadow thing walking through my house. One of the guys that defected, who was one of their close associates, he told me that these people said that they go out into the woods and they, they do ceremonies. And he also told us that they admitted it and that they admitted that they were astrally projecting into mine, Barton Nunley's house. Yeah, they admitted this. They admitted they admitted this stuff, dude. And so it was pretty heavy. And I had it was me and Bettina talking to this individual, and he was telling us everything that they they told him this stuff. And since then, they've sort of in a roundabout way threatened him. And so I just told him, look, I know we had some issues before. You were in their camp, you know. We had bad blood, but we're just you, you don't want to fight anymore. Go on, don't you know? Go your way. Peace be upon you and your family. And I told him to pray and keep your family close. Just be careful because these people are not good people. And uh, even yesterday at the end of the show, I prayed. Um, and then today I wake up to a vitriolic hate speech from this guy. I mean, he just called me everything in the book and accused me of every bad thing in the world. And everything that that guy told me that they were doing, he claimed on his live that we were doing it. Well, that's usually like, the technique, right? That is the technique. Yeah. And so, but he's, you know, it's crazy because he still managed, you know, at the, at, as of yesterday or this morning when I, or this afternoon when I saw the the numbers, he had a couple hundred fools in there looking at it. And you're going like, geez, dude. And one guy said, we're going to go and squash Josh. And I'm like, oh, that's cute. So, you know, a threat leveled at me. <clears throat> and they've been threatening me over and over again. And then he's talking about, I'm, he's afraid for his life. And I'm at, at the conclusion of this, I'm like, you basically threaten me over and over again. And you say you're in fear for your life. I'm like, okay. So right out of Mao Zedong's red book. Okay. The communist manifesto. If he's not a communist, like he says, he's not, um, he sure does use their techniques quite well. And then, you know, you see this black shadow thing. We saw it. There were three of us that looked over and I just literally was walking across my den. I mean, it was unreal. Um, and then we saw it again, but I'm not afraid of that stuff. And so I grabbed the St. Benedict, um, the pendant, where is it? My pendant at? I don't know where it says, right here. This is what it looks like, folks. I took that St. Benedict, you order the Benedictine monks. Um, they were all, they were always known as being very powerful. And if you go and get blessed, you know, which I'm not Catholic, but it does work. I had Rick Atrostain here was a demonologist, Catholic, uh, seminary guy. And, uh, he suggested that to me on my show, which I did. And I got holy water and I went through room to room. And in the name of Christ, I rebuked it. And then it ended up in my yard. So I went downstairs in the yard because the dogs wouldn't go outside to use the bathroom. And I cast it out of there and I heard it in the neighbor's yard and I heard this cackling laugh. And it was unbelievable. And, you know, I think my neighbors too are, yeah, I've wondered about it because when we moved into that place, the people that lived there before had some weird stuff there, mm -hmm. to say the least. I'm not going to get into it, but this 
individual who's bragging to this other guy who told us everything about what they were doing and their plans and whatever. Um, I do believe that they are, there are people who have the ability to do these things and that they are moved by evil, you know, mm-hmm. to do whatever. And they're able to do that. And, um, but in the end, it isn't, it's, it's, it's a short term thing. You might win some victories with that, but in the end, you're not going to win the war. And uh, I wonder, like, what is the end game? I mean, do these people really think that at some point that they're not going to face judgment for this? They don't think that they're not going to face, you know, something, you know, some kind of divine punishment. Yes, there's always a price to everything you do. There's a payment that will come due. It's it's like a credit card. You yeah, I don't pay. think there's any good that can come out of this back and forth. I, it just doesn't. It's never going to end good uh, for anybody. It's not going to end with you stopping what you're doing, and it's not going to end with them stopping what they're doing. I'm talking about their their profession or their yeah, exactly. Yeah, I get it. So it just doesn't make any the the, the the fighting could only either stop and everybody goes their separate ways, or it gets worse to the point where now there's God forbid violence happening between two people and that doesn't end good that always ends bad so there's you know for anyone that's listening that's all this fighting it should just stop stop everybody do their thing there's what eight billion people on the planet there is enough (laughs) people for everyone to have Mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of subscribers for what they do and never know about each other so i'm just saying it's it's um see there it is right there yeah. Clough, Clough's in here right now. He said, Wolf, he, Doss says you perform animal sacrifices. Yeah. Yeah, I own a lot of animals, okay? And they're not disappearing. They're just there. <laughs> There's a bunch of them. Yeah, um, even though we're, we're carnivores, uh, I don't think either of us would ever hurt an animal no. intentionally. Yeah, I, I don't think that... Um, I, I, own a, a, I own a pig. <laughs> and, and since I started, you know, owning, being the owner yeah. of a pig over a year ago, I have a squirrel quit eating pork. Yeah, you You're have a squirrel. Nice That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I will not eat pork anymore because a little dude. I just, I love him, dude. He's a good little dude, but, and but I have three. What about cats. bacon? I won't eat bacon. I don't eat pork Every, anymore, and I'm not. I'm not Muslim or Jewish. I just don't. I won't eat it because, out of respect for my my pig friend, I won't. Everything eat it. is better with bacon. Well, that's what they even say. bacon tastes better with bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a lot of animals, man. I have guinea pigs, and I have uh, well, I say I have we as a family, we have a lot of animals. And for him to say something like that, he's trying to hit me, <laughs> you know, hard somewhere, and it's not gonna work. I'm not, yeah, believe it or not, the you know, the guy Anton LaVey who wrote the Satanic Bible was against hurting animals, so there's a lot of misconceptions in regards to witchcraft and all that jazz i think a lot of people don't know what they're talking about so them accusing you of saying number one you you do witchcraft and then you sacrifice animals i think those are two completely different things because there's so many wiccans that would never hurt a soul like they wouldn't Mm -hmm. you know and again i'm an i'm an astronaut i just observe all of this i have my own faith and it's personal and it's for me but you know, in terms of my me observing all this stuff and studying it for years, I think Aleister Crowley was a really bad guy. I think Anton LaVey was just poking at people because he was an instigator. He was. But, yeah. Lion tamer. Yeah. And didn't you have like his uh, nephew or his grandson? Son? His grandson on your yeah. show. Yeah. You know, you can hear it. Those, I'll put those on YouTube. They've been on the regular list for a long For He, he died. Stanton, young guy, too. He died... Um, only a month after I interviewed him. And um, unfortunately, you know, he was a nice person. And he was just telling stories about how he grew up. You know, he didn't choose the family he grew up in. And he was talking about his grandpa and growing up in the black house. They're interesting stories. To me, that's what I like hearing these tales. They're never going to... Re- me talking to a person who grew up in Satanism is, Satanism is never going to make me a Satanist. You know, like I want to hear stories as long as they're good people and they're not talking about hurting other people all the time and fighting and whatever. 
I'm open to what they have to say. Stanton left behind this great two-part interview. You know, he really wanted to do it. And at the end, he was, so, I'm really happy I did this. It came out good, didn't it? I'm like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, uh, Don't let these people anywhere near your show because then you'll be a witch, a heretic. They I, really need to be those people with the power. Whether they say it or not, know? it's not going to make me a witch. You know? <laughs> It is in the title of your show. It's the title of your show. There you go. Yeah, it's also it's also means uh, into the un, unusual, you know, uh, out of the ordinary, and it's from a Dio song, by the way. Does <laughs> it? Is it? So you claim, sir? <laughs> si, senora, it does. I thought the British policies made the world England, sir. <laughs> they're, they're those people that should be wearing powdered wigs with the gavel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you're like, like fear and loathing. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I pay no mind. I mean, if they're not after you, and they're not after James. No, they're, they're not going to be. After my, my, I'm their target. I'm the big bad wolf, and I'm the target. Um, and fine, you know. In fact, I told my wife the other day. I said, "Who cares?" I told you this, Chris. Who cares? I said, "If they're coming after me." And that Allow means me to be the voice the of the reason. Alone. They're, they're watching you right now. They're watching this show. They uh, are. Ladies and gentlemen, how about this? As of this moment forward, call a unified truce. End it. Everybody get back to work and enjoy what you do. End of story. It's over. As of this moment, it's over. I wish. I wish I, you, you could say anything you want. You could pay them if you wanted to. They wouldn't. I don't think I need to. We, no. I'm going to be uh, uh, Lucky Luciano in this and end the war between all of you people. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is that the jealousy sets in and people and they just there is no guy. I, 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 I talked to this guy for 40 minutes and then I went to the grocery store and my wife's like, he's on there calling you a racist. And it was after we You're talked. You're really not a racist. No, but I know. True racists are actually very rare. There's bigots out there, but they're yeah. real racists. They're they're a rare, murky little breed. They're a murky little breed. And you yeah. know, the thing is, I mean, like my, my roommate who's black, Stefan Gilson, he's probably in the chat. He's Haitian descent. He's a really good guy. He's been working with him for us three and a half years. He got on there and said something to the guy, and the guy started calling him the token. I said, oh, okay. I thought Bettina was. But then I, oh, well, I thought it was the twins. I thought, so anybody that I associate with is black is now their enemy because that sounds not. a bit of a bigoted thing or an ignorant thing to say. Ridiculous. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And they've called me dirty Mexican, Spick, and well, they called me Nacho. That's quite bigoted. Yeah. And, and that's their whole thing. I mean, you know, if you if anybody who has half a brain looks at what they do, what I do, I'm over here trying to make content and do what I do. Their, their channel has become, or his, their, this particular guy's channel has become the Josh Turner channel. And one yeah. of them stopped. He stopped. He said, I'm done. I'm not going to fight anymore. You know, and he's like, I'm done. We're not. And that's Mike from AI. That's Mike. Right. That, that guy, he said, we're done. We t we talked and he said, we're no longer, we're not going to fight. We're done. He's done. And, and it so stayed that way. He's been that way for, okay. for you know, the, the, since we talked this last time. But the other ones. They're not going to let it go, they, and they want to keep it going. But it seems like now their only relevance is me. That's what you, it. What do you think the goal is? Well, I mean, th th I'm in the way. I'm in the way of them being able to bully, harass, and, and do whatever they do. They, they've been at, at perpetual war with people for a long, long time, and most of them just give up and go away and, and leave the field, and they drive them away. Um, but – you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day. Is Mike Bluler, and his, he's from Red Dirt Mafia. He's got a relatively new channel, but he's a really nice guy. Folks, go check him out. Mike's a nice guy, and he had told me the words of the, of the late Kerry Arnold, who I only got to correspond with one time, but basically the same thing, you know. And he told Mike Bluler, he said, "You got to be careful in this field because they're gangs." Like he told him, he described it as gangs. And if when I first got into this, I would have laughed and thought, oh, that's silly. There's gangs in this. No, there are. There really are. There's cliques. And this yeah, clique that I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm fighting with, they are a gang. I mean, one of them who drug me into this war, then immediately jumped onto their side, made me wonder if it wasn't all just a setup from the beginning. And then I find out, well, yeah, it is. 
they had targeted me and Bettina for a while. And it was basically, they, they even had a name for it, like project downfall or something like that. And wow. so, yeah, so it's, I was targeted for a while. And then when they see you rising up and doing things and not giving a damn about these people, whatever they're, you know, they come after you. So it's a lesson for anybody who's an up and comer podcaster, YouTuber. Um, if you're going to engage and try to, to dispel the myths and rumors and legends and hor horrible things, um, the alleged whatever that they say, you, you have to be very careful with these people because they key in on every word and then they'll go back and they'll make a video and they'll take everything you say out of context. And that and they live, they live to do this and they try to destroy people. They have a, they have vowed that they're going to destroy me. I mean, they have said it on their channel. They are going to stop at nothing to destroy me. So that's where the legality comes into play. So that's why like today, I said, that, that, that's yeah. absurd to even think you'd be successful Ridiculous. at that unless it, they would bring it to some kind of violence, which is just even more absurd. So it just doesn't make any sense. It's uh, like I said, you know, if, if all you good people are listening, end it today, end it now, Wish go back to doing what you're doing, fortify your work, focus on bring big imagination into what you're doing because you have everybody has an audience and now they the audience wants to see as far as your imagination can go and and to entertain them and bring them incredible stories and enlighten them and that's what everybody should be individually focused on and i say this because i observed like all the great filmmakers of the 70s or and be, wow. before that and they all kind of there was like friendly competition because they would be like oh yeah watch this oh yeah I got an idea, watch this. But it was never like, I'm gonna take you down. Cause movie makers are either, all right, I have no, I don't like his movies. And that's the worst they'll say. But the other ones that are friends are challenging each other. Cause think about some of your favorite filmmakers, you know, even of that time, like Lucas, Coppola, um, Walter Hill, like all these guys were kind of, uh, Martin Scorsese, they were all challenging each other. Mm -hmm. So why, you guys have an art form to what you do just be, just do the best at your thing and it'll be great. And everybody, again, the audience is big enough and voracious. Yeah. Enough. You would think, right. But yeah. it's, it's, it's it, to, to me. And I asked the defector about this. I said, what is their end game? Same thing you do. Actually, Bettina, I think didn't, he said, there isn't one. They're just jealous and they want you gone. Maybe they don't realize there's, this is the wrong way to go. Cause eventually it'll implode. Because the audience is going to be like, I've had enough. Yeah. I don't want to listen to this anymore. And it'll be over. And they're going to go on. There's going to be some other dude on the side of this that's building his thing or somebody else building her thing. And they're going to get the attention of everybody because people are going to be so sick of all the arguing, mm -hmm. arguments and, and fighting. Which I presented really that argument to this guy. Yeah. And, and like I said. Within within 30, 40 minutes after we talked, he was on the show saying a bunch of crap. I mean, it, it just yeah, it was like somebody's a bad instigator in this situation. There's no way you yeah. can. There's nothing you can do with that person. Larry Fisher says Jesus was without sin. And if he murdered, that would have been a sin in the law of books. Larry, I love Larry. He's a supporter of the show, but he's always challenging me. Larry, what I'm going to explain to you one more time, and I'll do it very quickly and abbreviated. Lazarus, he rose Lazarus from the dead. He allowed Lazarus to die. <clears throat> he could have showed up. He could have ran over there and showed up before he died and he healed him. But he allowed him to die and even wept with his sisters. I explained that earlier. There's a reason for that. When Jesus pushed the child off of the roof, whether it was uh, part of the canon or not of the Bible, um, when he was questioned, he rose him back up. He said, there. He's alive. So it didn't matter. They were children and they were playing. And he pushed him and the kid fell and died. Whether he murdered him or pushed him, that's speculative. But he rose him up almost to prove a point. Um, so if somebody kills you, but then they just raise you back from the dead, it's not even death. It's not murder. And in fact, it can be some sort of a, somewhat of a gift if you know near-death experience does allow you to have second sight nine times out of ten after it happens. So it could be a divine gift. <clears throat> There's many different ways to look at it. All different cultures and religions will have a different take on it. So Larry, therefore, Jesus did not murder. Thank you for your argument. 
Um, <laughs> this is some funny stuff in here. Yeah. Oh, man. No, Morgan, no, he does not. She asked if Stefan had any voodoo stories. No, he's been here since he was young. He didn't have any. Um, and then Larry goes on to say, if Christ murdered anyone, he would not be perfect. So the lost books of the Bible that state are fairy tales. Christ was perfect. Yes. Um, no, I don't believe they're fairy tales, but I don't, I don't believe every book of the King James Version of the Bible either. Larry is a very staunch King James Version Bible Belt Christian person who mm -hmm. believes everything of the King James Version. And if it's not in the King James Version, then it's absolutely not true. But what makes our show what it is, is that everybody can believe how they want to believe. And I'm not going to try to force my beliefs on you. And I still love Larry. He's a good guy. He's my brother in Christ. And I totally forgive your freaking ignorance. Just kidding, Larry. I love you. Everybody's allowed to have their opinion. And as long as you don't take it to a level of insulting and ad hominem, we're okay. It's all okay. It's all good. Chris, anything you want to say before we get out of here? Either one of you, Chris's? Um, yeah, just uh, keep an open mind because we don't have the answers. And uh, I, I couldn't possibly shut down a theory because I don't have the answers. So I'm, oh, and I've had odd experiences. So I'm open to it. So stay open to these stories. Listen, that's how we learn. And an, an imagination, imagine scenarios, imagine ways to find more clues, I guess, if you, your goal is to prove these things. I think more importantly, to understand to understand as a, a, a part of our human journey. That's pretty much it. James, what do you have to say for yourself and your well, mustache? Somebody said your you know, mustache uh, game was strong. Clough, it was Clough Paranormal <laughs> Drama yeah. and Things. He said he liked my mustache, <laughs> which, well, I've had it uh, a long time. It, true story. I had my mustache. I kept it in basic training at Fort Knox which you're not allowed to have that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I took an envelope and I cut my mustache off. I kept it in the envelope in my pocket. So I always had it. <laughs> <laughs> There's expanded perspectives right there. They said, just joining now, I've personally met and or interviewed all three of these gentlemen and they're stand up guys. Keep doing what you were doing. So <laughs> Kyle and Cam actually interviewed you guys too. I yeah. talked to them. I wow. was on Chris's. I was on Chris Chris's show too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're I thought right I was dead. special. Now I know y'all just been out being interviewed by everybody. I guess it was your publicist or something had contacted me and said that you were, uh, you should be on my show. Who? My publicist? No, uh, Chris. Yeah, that was when I was collaborating with the distributor. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah we've got a, quite a few over here. We got a whole uh -huh. collection. What do we got? It's, All uh, right. Here. Sherlock Holmes. Mm. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so so the, the wolf with the hat, Mr. Gentleman Wolf, whatever, what is that? You know, there's a there is a collection of incredible artists on Etsy <laughs> where they make their own sculptures and then you can buy resin versions of their sculptures. So this fantastic Etsy artist, which I could give you the name after, I gotta find it. I don't know it by, by heart, but I have several of his sculptures. However, I got to keep some of them in this room because he was nice enough. I, I sent him a whole story saying squirrel attack. He, my squirrel, for some reason, likes to behead statues. <laughs> They're like murder scenes. So I'll come home and she's like just sitting there by herself looking at me. And I'm like, what did you do? And she removes the heads of some of these statues. So I, had, I have to keep the Gentleman Wolf in here. He repaired it for free, the artist. But, yeah, this is an Etsy artist. He sculpted the Gentleman Wolf. And Dude, you should, you should awesome. get, give him my information. This was sculpted uh, for me. Well, not with the maracas, but that is a very good <laughs> rendition of what I saw when That's I was great. 15 years old. That looks very much like what I saw. That's fantastic. Except this one here is a little more cheery. He's got the... He's happy. It's, he's at a quinceanera. You know I, mean? I mean, they make they make action figures out of anything. Ah, uh, that's pretty Darling cool. Alex. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that oh. one at the theater, too, when it came out. Oh, wow. What a movie. But I was able to find your book. It was hidden on the shelf back here. Like <laughs> I said, I need very interesting story for anybody that's looking for something to read. Uh, 
Chris, you need to send me a copy of your uh, of South Texas Blues autographs. I mean, I, I, I will. Um, oh. Now I'm expanding it into a six hour thing, and it I can't say much about it publicly right now, but it's attached to now, and it's not just South Texas Blues, but it's you know I think maybe six other mo- feature length movies that are all going mm-hmm. into production too that are in similar nature. That's the best I'll say right now. I can tell you in private exactly what it is. I have a question, uh, Chris, because I'd usually do a giveaway to end the show. Would you be willing to, uh, do you have any copies of South Texas Blue in hand? I don't have any extras here. I, I have to order uh, author copies from mm-hmm. the publishing program, and then I'll have them sent wherever. You know. Yeah, so let's do that. I want, I want to have you uh, send off a couple, and then if you could too, Chris, a couple of your books, and I will pay for the books. And no, that's okay. Handling. And, and so I'll pay for it to you guys down on. I will pay for it and shipping and handling. Just just send me the invoice and I'll pay it. I always get this wrong. Is it forthwith? Forth, how do you say it? I will pay it forthwith. I don't know how you say it. Anyway. Forth, <laughs> forthwith. Forthwith. Whatever. I will pay it. And Nobody then, says that anymore. No, well, I do. I'm trying to bring it back. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to bring what is that on Mean Girls? Fetch happened here, all right? <laughs> so look, I will send it to you guys the, the money and and no, no, no. a couple I'll, people from yeah. the uh, from the audience here. Who has not won a giveaway from a uh, from a, a paranormal roundtable? If you're in the audience and you want a book, South Texas Blues, um, you can pick one of your books. Chris James, you have a couple of really good books. Um, Charles I'll, B. I'll probably publish Montauk Boys by uh, the December holidays uh, for sure. And I'm, I'm going to read a part of a chapter actually on my newsletter this week from Montauk Boys just to give you an idea of what this whole thing is about. Charles B. says he hasn't won. Yeah, I would love that, Chris. Um, so, Chris James, do you want to uh, tell him? A, what, do you have any of your books on hand or do you need to order uh. something? Did you get that box I sent you? Yes, I did. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've got uh, a few bucks laying around. Uh, I just need to get the time to box them up and ship them off if you need some more. Yeah, does he have, do you have an address? Uh, do you have a, uh, Charles V, you need to get, give them your address or whatever. Whichever guy you guys, Chris, you can you send it to Charles V? Sure, I think if I can. Let me see. I don't. I think I can order several author copies maybe to here and then then ship it if you want it signed. I have to order uh, yeah. the author well, copies. Why don't you do this, Chris, because I need several copies for myself. Okay. So just go ahead and send me five, and then you can send two off to the other to the winners. Okay. If you can do that. So that way you order seven. You order several at a time, and um, I'll buy five for myself. Yeah, and let me just sort it out. Numbers. i got to look inside the program and just see how it works. It should be easy. Yeah, it's not hard. And then – because I do that. I order author yeah. copies of my books and stuff. Um, and, of course, the conference is coming up. Uh, are you going to try and make this conference, Chris? I am, Unless I have to be on set, I, I sh- it should be no problem. I'm going to try and push it to October or maybe even like – October is going to be fantastic because A Haunting We Will Go will be ready. That It'll would be, be awesome. Yeah. Because the presentation we you did last year, I was with you on it. And yeah. speaking of Expanded Perspectives, they were there too at the conference – Chris James, you have to be at this next one. You got it. it's closer to you this time. Uh, like, like I said, as long as I can drive there and back, uh, no problem. Well, well, if we have to, we'll pay to get your truck fixed. <laughs> I've got the RT. Truck. We'll put it on there. We'll use it as a write-off. Look, we got to have you get. I got my truck fixed. It's the hotel staying that I can't stand. I can't oh, stand staying in a hotel room. I don't either. I don't like the. the I've uh, got a no. travel trailer parked out I've here in the front so lawn. Much that, you know, yeah, yeah, it becomes yeah. yeah. So if if it's close enough and there's an RV place close by, not a problem. How about should be in New Braunfels? I want to do it in New Braunfels. I think New Braunfels would be a nice place. There's a lot of good places to eat there. I I like going to Alpine Haas. It's haunted. I had two weird experiences there. There's also that haunted bridge where they keep seeing a Civil War ghost standing in the middle of the bridge. Well, hell, that one bridge, I got a dogmatic uh, encounter story from somebody that this guy, Travis, and that, he says he's going to be there at the conference. So if he shows up, conference, Travis, uh, shout out to you. But he's the one that saw the two dogmen that come up to his tent when mm. he was homeless. He was traveling to San Antonio. So he stopped in New Braunfels and he went up under the bridge and these two werewolf looking creatures you know messed with him um he got really fortunate i guess 
Somebody says here, tons of RB parking in New Braunfels. People go camp in the float the river. Yes, Morgan. So, Charles V, get with Chris. Do you have an email address that you can yes. put on in the chat? Put it in the chat so Charles oh. V can get it and you can mail him the book and then charge uh, me for it. So, anybody else yeah. who hasn't won, this one will be for Chris Garitano's book, South Texas Blues. Chat was rolling earlier. Now it's stopped. Come on, guys. Phil Barnes. Please. Oh, Philip, you were at the conference. Yeah, Philip was at the conference. I, I saw you there. Philip, have you won a giveaway from Paranormal Roundtable? Be honest. And Morgan says, I haven't won. Philip says, I want a copy. Okay. Then Autumn Lehman says, she hasn't won. Autumn Lehman is also a uh, member. Um, one of the things that was suggested by Tony, my godson, colleague, and co-host, is that we give precedence to people who, if it comes down to picking people, who are members. Because we don't have any real perks for the members. We have the Patreon. Mm -hmm. People subscribe to that. But the uh, if you're a member, so if you're a member, Autumn Lehman says she hasn't won. And you're a member. You're a member. Somebody's giving you a membership or you bought one. So... We will do Autumn. Um, if you haven't won, we're going to have you, Garitano, send your book to Autumn. So, Autumn. Okay, yeah, just send me all the information, and I'm happy to yes, send it. In fact, y'all could just – easiest way to do it, guys, you, the winners, send me your email your email through my – send it to me, Josh Turner at prtpodcast.com. Charles V, you do the same thing. Autumn Lehman, you do the same thing. Send me your – information josh turner at prtpodcast.com and i will send it to these gentlemen and then they can get your books out forthwith <laughs> post taste somebody post taste there you go forthwith post i don't even know whatever now for some odd reason it the uh, my my email address isn't going out on the comments it just says the comment has failed to pass paranormal roundtable probably because you're not subscribed it's... you need to subscribe what are you doing chris Jeez. I am subscribed. I can't believe you're not. You're not. You are you subscribed? I, I believe I am. Mm. I get your your uh, videos on my uh, yeah tablet all the time. Yeah, and the podcast too. Yeah. Do you do you ever comment? No. I'm, <laughs> yeah, because there could be what it is. I mean, like th th they'll unsubscribe people, and then we'll have oh. to go back and be like, "Okay, you unsubscribe." Usually, when I'm listening to you, the show has already been uh, recorded because I listen to podcasts when I'm either working in the yard, traveling, or working in the kitchen. So it's not one of these things where I'm listening live just because y'all are on way too late. 12 30 at night yeah night. sometimes it goes late you know, sunday show is easy it's seven to ten i mean mm. and it's it we get a lot of people we usually get over 600 people in the chat but we get a lot of people that come in and, and watch it afterwards we get thousands of views on those um so autumn nope. send me your information josh turner okay well then i don't know what's going on i have to figure that out uh, another thing too, Anthony Mo Ali had messaged me and said he can't get in. He usually comments all the time. He said he got hidden. I don't know who hit him. One of the the people with the wrench might have hit him. Um, but Autumn Lehman, send me your information. Charles V, send me your information if you want a book, and we'll send it to you. That is Josh Turner at prtpodcast.com. Uh, Philip Barnes says he is not one. So Philip, I'm going to choose you too. And so send me your, your email address. We got one more. We're going we're gonna to do one more. So that's two from each of y'all. And like I said, I'll, I'll cover the shipping, the handling, and everything. <clears throat> Who else wants a book? Somebody want to win? Autumn says, awesome. Thank you. Mm. Brianna L says here. What does that mean? Miss Wendy, if you win and you're in the UK, if you ever get win a giveaway, Paul Sinclair or Deborah Hatswell, I have a deal with them. They will send you a book and I pay them and then they'll send it to you. So if you ever want to win a uh, something, whatever. 
So, but these guys wouldn't be able to do it because it's too expensive. But I ordered a book out of England one time by uh, Jasper Ford, uh -huh. and it, it got held up in customs for like two months. I don't know. What, some customs agent was probably reading it. <laughs> dude, it is so wacky, dude. It, I've sent stuff over there, and they've gotten it in a week. Mm -hmm. And I've sent stuff, and they didn't get it for like, you know, five weeks. I ordered some coffee from Israel one time, and I'm wondering what the people at Customs, whether they were making pots of coffee on the side to see, because it took six months to get it. It was just a bag of coffee, like a one-pound bag. For a second, only because it's getting late. I literally thought you ordered a cup of coffee from Israel. No, a bag. <laughs> Bag of coffee. Maybe I said so. I don't know. Yeah. It's late. Oh, so, shoot. So, you're, in, you're in Florida, so it's even later. Yeah. Here, day, Dylan. I'll pick you here, day, Dylan. He says, I haven't won yet. Here, day, send me your information. Josh Turner, PRTPodcast.com. I have both of these gentlemen's information. I'll send it to them, and then they can send you the books out. And I do want five of yours, uh, Garitano. I think I got I got a box of yours somewhere, Chris, mm -hmm. but I still have to put put the storage of the books are stacked up because i have about a thousand well not a thousand but probably about 500 of my books stacked on top of everything mm -hmm. so yeah we'll definitely get it done all right cappy luwak i've had it uh do what cappy luwak somebody said uh you should try it it tastes okay uh, i didn't taste weasel poop it, it's a weasels <laughs> That's the right, cappies. and they actually poop it out, and, and supposedly then, it gives it this great taste. And I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm very it tastes good. okay. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm not gonna do it. I, I've tried ants. I hear that they want us to eat bugs and stuff, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, dude. Thank you. <laughs> not gonna happen. Lemur poop. All right, guys, I'm gonna let y'all run and close out the show. Thank you guys for tuning in, showing up, and I appreciate everything, <laughs> folks. For stick around us. for a minute. I'm gonna talk to y'all for a minute. And uh, I'm going to let you guys run. I'll see you guys. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Take care. So that was Chris James, Chris Garitano. And Chris James has been co-hosting with me um, through this whole UAP thing. Larry, my brother Larry. What am I going to do with you, Larry? Now, Larry's comment here. All right. So Larry says war criminal seven that's one of our, our people here i know that god said he made me i was not made by a false deity of the sumerians their false god was the anunnaki no that's not true and i'll tell you what it which are which are that they the anunnaki were not god they were not god the sumerians looked at them as gods because they were gods to them little g god little g like the you know, lower, whatever. How do you do it? G like that? I don't know. Whatever. They are not God to me. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean that they didn't make you. Doesn't mean that they didn't terraform. It doesn't mean that they didn't do those things. It doesn't mean that they didn't take humans that were already here and genetically modify them. We don't know. We really don't know. Now, you're arguing something because I know you hold fast to what you believe, and that's perfectly fine. But I've read a lot of these texts that you are talking against and saying all this, you know, whatever. You're, you're in anger, whatever. I don't know if you're angry or not. I believe in God as in the Father of Christ. Now, when it talks at the beginning of the Bible, and I hate that this, this is, has to be discussed again. There is some discrepancy about who is saying this. And if you go back and you, there's, just, there's too much to read or get into in this little bit of time I have left tonight. I can't do that. I can't do that. But if you go back and you read, you may understand a little more about where we come from and who we are. And even if these other beings were responsible for creating us, that doesn't mean that there isn't a God and doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't his son. Now, I catch enough shit from everybody about this, okay? Because people can't wrap their minds around it. They don't understand it, and they don't do any research on it. They just go, oh, you're wrong, and you're a witch. So, Larry, I would appreciate it if you'd get off my ass.
right now. Okay. If you don't understand it, don't understand it, but you don't have to keep vocalizing it over and over again. I get that you don't get it. I get that. And I get that you don't understand what the hell we're trying to talk about, but continually making statements over and over again is starting to get aggravating to me. I like you. We're friends. Agree to disagree. There are a lot of different people's opinions and views coming here. And I look at you as a dear friend. But I'm not saying that a, that, that that is God. Okay. I'm talking about the people that lived under their rule would look at them as God. And if you think that those advanced beings didn't create clones, then you're very not with it. Because we are creating clones. If I make a clone, does that make me God? No, it doesn't. But could I rule over it and lord over it as a God? Yes, I could. But it doesn't make you a God. You can call yourself a hot dog. You can call yourself a bubblelicious fish. Like I said earlier, doesn't make it true. And you could scream it till your ears bleed. Doesn't make it true. Do I believe that they are my God? No, I don't. Okay. So you're arguing and you're telling Matt this other thing like, well, I'm, I'm not that. I don't believe in that. Well, don't believe in it. Okay. Your agginess is showing. All right. And don't say anything about that because I wore my Aggie shirt earlier to my live because they're my second favorite Texas team. Making a joke. But I love you, my friend. But I, I respectfully, please, you gotta stop saying things because one day I'll sit with you and I will actually show you and you can read it and you can see what you think. The translations, the biggest attack on me that comes from the, um, the peanut gallery is that people have not read what I've read. They haven't studied what I've studied and they don't speak several languages. So they're not going to understand. And if I sat down, and I'm not calling you a name here, but if I sat down with a jackass, and by that man I mean like a mule, a, a, a donkey, and tried to explain it, arithmetic, will it understand it? No, it won't. Even if I sat there day after day after day and tried to explain it, the multiplication table, it would not get it because it's not geared to understand it. So what I'm trying to teach is not for you. So move on. But others are here to, to learn and to understand and to grow. And we learn and we grow together. So I had Garitano on. He's a very good friend of mine. Chris James, very good friend of mine. And Josh Cutchin, very good friend of mine. The people that come on and they talk. I'm not the bad guy. And I'm sick and tired of being called a witch and, what, and a heretic and whatever these people want to do. Who gives a bucket of hamster vomit about these people? Sick and tired of it. Brianna says, oh, that's a nice comment. I'm not Catholic, but I respect your right to... I've defended on my show people from various religions. I defended Catholicism, even though, and that made people say that I was a Catholic, and they began to attack me for that. The reason I defended Catholicism is because Protestants say that Catholics worship idols. My answer to that, and I'm going to wrap this up, and if you're listening still, God bless you. My answer to that is no, that's a lie. They pray in the word means to beseech. Oh, Lord, I pray thee. And Lord doesn't mean God, unless it's used in that certain contextual sense. Lord means master. I will say this. I have defended Muslims. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not, I don't practice Islam. They say they don't believe in Christ. Yes, they do, but not like I do. They believe that he was the greatest of the prophets, but he wasn't the son of God in the way that we believe he was the son of God. 
People will say Protestants came into being because uh, a king wanted to annul his marriage. I saw somebody post that in a Catholic group the other day, and I was I didn't like that. I said that's not true. That's King Henry the Eighth, and he created the Anglican Church, but he did not create Protestant Protestantism. That was Martin Luther. In this world that we're living in, in this country, I put a video on my Facebook. Go look at it. They interviewed like 20-something different college-age kids who couldn't even tell you how many states there were or who the first president was. They couldn't even tell you whether Hawaii was a country or a state. They couldn't answer the most basic questions about history, about science, about anything completely ignorant. They couldn't do math. How many dimes are in a dollar? And the guy said six. So the last thing I need are my own friends attacking me when they misunderstand what I'm saying. I have enough, I have my hands full with my enemies who are constantly on the attack. They're ignorant, wicked backbiters who will stop at nothing to see me driven from this field. It's not going to keep me up at night. It's not going to stop me. I'm not going to let them win. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue to teach. I'm not a liar. I did 225 44 times, and I videoed it last night. So I will be showing it tomorrow. I also show an exercise that will help protect your rotator cuff so it won't get torn. And every week I will show you another exercise and what it does and how it works on your body until I get through the 43 exercises that I do. I do typically anywhere from 35 to 44 exercises. I don't usually go beyond that. That's way, that's a whole lot. Last night I did 44. Don't typically do that, but I hadn't been in the gym in a week. And I believe in weightlifting. I believe it's a fountain of youth. I'm 48 years old. I'm not 5'7", 500 pounds, as Mr. Doss has claimed. I'm not satanic, as he has claimed, and I don't kill my animals, as he's claimed. He is a psychopath who I honestly, he says he's in fear of his, I'm in fear of my life. Because anyone who would say these kind of things has something chemically wrong and balanced in their brain. Or they're possessed by something evil. People who will sit there and listen to this guy's vitriolic diatribe of diarrhea and satanic hatefulness have something wrong with them in their own heart to listen to that for an hour or an hour and a half or two hours. He's also doing the bidding of another man who's even eviler than him. These people have avowed to their allies and to their friends that they are going to destroy me. And they said they will do whatever it takes. And they can't deny this because their own camp came forward and told me this. And they said it with Bettina Moss on the phone. So when you look at this and what these people are trying to do to me, trying to do to this field, the last thing I need is people in my camp calling me out and saying all this crazy stuff about whatever. If you don't understand the question, wait and talk to me in private and I'll explain it to you. I can also give you a list of things to read. If you don't have time, then don't do it. If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. I will not force anyone to do anything they don't want to do. I live in peace and harmony with everyone in my household, my animals, humans, myself. You have to be in touch with yourself too. It's very important. I work out. I do what I say I do. I showed a video of me on the speed bag. I've showed videos of me lifting weights to show you that I'm not a liar. My detractors will say and do anything and they will stop at nothing to see me destroyed. They want me to die. I, on the other hand, only ask that they leave me alone. They won't do that. So I spent two hours today with attorneys. There will be a peace. And they will stop. It doesn't matter what they want. Like my dad used to say, and this is crass. 
and I'm sorry for the curse words, but you can shit in one hand and one in the other and see which one you get first. What they want is not important. What will be is important. They can project all they want, but the truth is the truth, and I don't have to keep on sitting here defending it. It defends itself. To my brother, Larry, I love you, Larry. You're a good guy. You've helped me out. You work for me. I believe you're a salt of the earth kind of guy. And you believe how you believe. But you don't need to post it on there a hundred times because you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. The possibilities are what they are. And it doesn't change a damn thing. If we were genetically grown in a lab, it doesn't change who God is. That's the mistake that people make. Of thinking that I've lost touch with who God is or what God is. I feel like I'm closer to God than most people. Not in the way that I'm a better than them person, but I'm more, I understand the nature of reality more than most people. Sometimes when I talk, people misinterpret things and they think it's being braggadocious. I assure you, I'm not trying to. I'm being absolutely genuine and honest with you. People aren't used to that. They're used to snake oil salesmen, liars, frauds, and hoaxers. So when someone comes along and says, this is the truth and this is the way it is, well, they're so used to being pooped on that they they just think you're another pooper. I'm not. When people tell you that they care about you, Have a nice day, blah, blah, blah. Do they really mean it or are they just going through the motions? I feel deeply, very, very deeply from what I've observed, more deeper than a lot of people. People don't have time or energy for that. I have a lot of energy. They've been attacking me since the conference for six solid months. And I'm still here and I'm not going anywhere. And now there are seven of them. A couple of them have cited that they want peace. That's fine. They can can concentrate all the power in the world that they want on me. You're not going to break me. You're not going to stop me. I'm not even going to bend. You're not going to chip me. What's going to happen is going to reflect back on you and it's going to blast you. And if you want to pretend in your mind that it's some sort of magic, no, it's called the Holy Spirit. It's called God protects me. Because I pray and I ask him to. Simple as that. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow night. We'll be on again tomorrow night. 7 o'clock. We'll be retelling people's encounters tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed the show and you learned something. And um, like I said, no hard feelings to anyone, to War Criminal or Brother Larry. Um, just a little misunderstanding, but when you keep on repeating that you're, you know, you don't, in this chat, you don't have to reaffirm that you're a God-fearing Christian, Larry, we know you are. I know you personally in my real life. You've worked shifts for me and you're a good stand-up dude. You know, I'll give you a shirt off my back and you know, the door's always open. You want something from the PRT store, you just show up right here and come get it. And you know that you're a special person to us. So please, get off my back. God bless you too, Jason. Thank you to everybody. Joyce Perfecto, Madeline. I see everybody in chat here. Ace Banner. If I didn't say your name, it's not because I didn't notice. I just I care about all you, JoJo, everybody, Brianna, Blue Crew, Smurfy. Did I miss anybody on this last one here? Uh, Tane D, Auntie, Auntie Honey, everybody. Thank you for everybody that donated. I know money's tight right now. It is what it is. Um, I did announce earlier today in the earlier live that we may be cutting the fi- the Friday show out and just doing it on Sunday, which will make it every other week. We'll have a guest and then we'll have, you know, a regular show because it's Friday's not doing too well. We're only getting about 400 people in the chat, you know. Um, it is what it is, but we'll be fine. Spanner protectors, what do they say? Okay. All right. All right, guys. I'll see you.
Thank you and good night. And go check out Expanded Perspectives. They got a great show. Chris James' show, um, Strange Things. And go check out Chris Caritano's show. He does a good job, Off to the Witch. And then he's got the other one called, um, what's the other one he's got coming out? Uh, Haunting We Will Go. Of course, he's done the Montauk Chronicles, Dark Files, and, and Strange World, which is how I met him, was through Strange World. All right, folks, I'll see you and good night.